morning again and good morning to everyone who has joined our meeting this morning. This, mo this meeting uh, is a meeting of the Portfolio Committee on Health uh, to receive a, a presentation by the National Department of Health and the Ministry on the annual performance plan and of the budget for the 2022-2023 financial year held on this 22nd of April, 2022. So you are all very welcome to this meeting. Please note that I see a number of television stations and channels uh, also on our platform. So members, please be reminded to switch on your cameras when you do make any input. Ms. Majalamba, if you can just confirm attendance and apologies for me, thank you. Good morning and thank you, Chair. Present is Dr. Jacobs, Mr. Munyai, Ms. Kela, Dr. Harvard, Ms. Clark, Ms. Wilson, Ms. Ishmael, Dr. Tembe Kwayo, Mr. Van Staden, and Mr. Imam Sheikh. Ms. Sukers will join the meeting later. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable Clark. Um, good morning, Chair. Um, I just wish to inform you that I might have to move out my house and go and sit in my car and reconnect there during the meeting. My geezer burst this morning, so I've got chaos in my home at the moment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Honourable uh, members, I also want to confirm attendance of the Ministry of the Department of Health. Um, Mr. Joe Hartler, PLO, can you uh, confirm who is present from the department and the ministry on the platform? Yes, good morning, Honorable Chair and all members. Uh, uh, Honorable Chair, the minister is on the platform and he will take it from here. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Honorable members, before we continue, let me remind you that this virtual meeting is deemed to be in the precinct of Parliament and therefore constitutes a meeting of a committee of the National Assembly for official purposes only. In addition to the rules of virtual sittings, the rules of the National Assembly, including the rules of debate, apply. Members enjoy the same powers and privileges that apply in a sitting of the National Assembly. Members shall equally note that anything said in the virtual platform is deemed to have been said to the House and may be ruled upon. All members who have logged in shall be considered to be present and are requested to mute their microphones and only unmute when recognized to speak. This is because the microphones are very sensitive and will pick up noise which might disturb the attention of other members. When recognized to speak, please unmute your microphone and connect your video. Members may make use of the icons on the bar at the bottom of their screens, which has an option that allows a member to put up his or her hand to raise points of order. The secretariat will assist in alerting the chairperson to members requesting to speak. When using the virtual system, members are urged to refrain or desist from unnecessary points of order. So we will go to uh, invite the minister to do some introductory remarks and also to introduce the team. Honorable uh, Minister Joe Parker. I thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, Honorable Chair, Honorable uh, Jacobs. Uh, good morning to yourself, uh, to also to the honorable members of the Portfolio Committee for Health. Uh, good morning to my colleague, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, Dr. Lomo, who is uh, in the KZN uh, province in Etequini, um, where he is still in the front line of uh, supporting the efforts um, dealing with the disaster of the flood. Um, so he's participating from that side of, of our country. Uh, Honorable Chair, I'm with um, a team from the department, um, the managers of the department led by uh, the Director General, Dr. Butelezi. Um, uh, they will, those who will be presenting 
items will, in, will be introduced. Uh, um, the DG will do so. So uh, we wish to take this opportunity to thank you, Honorable Chair and the members, to give us a, a chance to present um, the annual performance plan of 2022-23 of the National Department of Health. As we know, honorable members, that uh, the last two years, the 2020-2021 and 2021-22, uh, were the years dominated by the pandemic of COVID-19 with a lot of energy, a lot of uh, fi uh, financial resources, a lot of human resources, and a lot of our programs uh, weighing heavily more in the direction of the containment of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the public health uh, measures which have been taken, and uh, later, as more especially during the course of the 2021-22, uh, a lot of effort uh, being put on the rollout of the vaccination program, uh, which we're still continuing at the present moment. So we're hopeful as we present this uh, annual performance plan that 2022-23 financial year will be different from the last two financial years, that we hope that there will be more stability uh, in the uh, pandemic, that the pandemic will be better contained. Uh, we're hopeful that from the experience of the last uh, quarter, uh, the last quarter of uh, in the last financial year, 2021-22, um, uh, where with the advent of the Omicron, which descended on us as a variant of the pandemic uh, uh, as to uh, the end of uh, the year 2021 and the beginning of 2022, which uh, even though was highly tra transmissible, has shown uh, characters, characters of uh, uh, less severity, and, and as uh, various medical uh, specialists and scientists have said, uh, partly because of uh, the immunity, high levels of immunity due to vaccination and also uh, the uh, natural immunity, but also some indications that the virus itself may have been uh, less uh, severe, uh, in, in less virulent. So I'm hoping that this will continue. Uh, and so that this year, 2022-2023 financial year, we can be able to focus uh, quite uh, more squarely on the programs which we are presenting here today and not be uh, again diverted to the extent that that's happened over the last two years, where, as, as I've said, both financial and human resources and other focus on programs uh, were have, weighed heavily on the containment of COVID, and we lost some ground in the implementation of some of our planned programs. We hope 22, 23 will be different. Uh, I must just quickly allude to the fact that uh, over the last few days, we have seen worrying signs uh, of the rise in the level of uh, COVID infections. We hope that uh, uh, this will not go much higher uh, but uh, we, we're monitoring and we will be able to report back to the committee and to the public uh, once we have uh, seen the trend. Uh, we need to give it a little bit more time to see how it is going. But we hope that even if there's a, a rise as we go into the winter, uh, that uh, it will not be disruptive enough to divert us from our programs. Uh, uh, honorable members, we know that as we present here the plans and the financial resources uh, allocated to those plans, we know that the finances are never enough, especially in the highly burdened uh, public health system, which carries a lot of uh, uh, huge uh, burden of disease, looking after uh, the entire population. Uh, we know that even though we have a dual system, a two-tier system, where we work uh, hand in hand with the private health system, but the burden of, uh, the large burden of looking after uh, the huge uh, component of the population uh, lies with the public health system. Uh, and so uh, we know that uh, as we will be outlining here the programs and the financial resources, this can never be enough, but we have to do the best 
with what we have been allocated. Uh, we often don't appreciate the, the huge burden which is carried by the public health system, but it's uh, 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 from time to time when we have to interact uh, quite on the front line with the, the public health system that we appreciate the, the, the volume of work which is carried uh, uh, in, in this case. And just to say that uh, on Tuesday when I was also in the uh, KZN, we visited the Prince Mshieni Hospital, uh, which is called also one of those quite affected by the floods uh, because of the uh, destruction of the water supply system uh, in the Umlazi Township. Uh, the hospital uh, did not have uh, supply of water from the municipal system because of the breakdown of of the of the water pipes, um, and but at the same time as they were really make, making do with the water tank delivery to keep the hospital functional, um, uh, at the same time uh, it, it was really uh, carrying quite a huge number of people. Just on the Tuesday when we were there. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the hospital, the outpatients and, and all the clinics were really very, very, very busy. And when we inquired about the expected number of uh, 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 people to be treated in, uh, on the outpatients just on that day, uh, they indicated that it's between 1,500 1, to 1,800 just as visits to the hospital in one day. Um, so, so that reminds us the kind of uh, number of uh, clients which our public health system have to carry. Now, you can imagine uh, in the midst of the disaster where there is not adequate supply of water, uh, but because people need services, uh, just on that day, uh, they were going to be seeing just between 1,005 and 1,800 uh, clients uh, on the outpatient basis. So that is just a reminder of the, the amount of work which is carried by a public health system. We want to take this opportunity to assure this committee, uh, the portfolio uh, committee of, uh, uh, for health, and also the people of the of South Africa that working with our colleagues in the provinces, we will do our best uh, to make sure that uh, with the resources allocated to us, we uh, discharge our responsibility of providing health services to our people to the best of our, our ability. We, we remain committed to the attainment of a long and healthy life for all South Africans. Uh, with that, Honorable Chair, uh, I would want to invite the uh, uh, Director General Dr. Butelezi to indicate uh, the presentation which will be made by members of uh, the, the team uh, from health, uh, which will outline our our mission and our objectives. What what is it? What is this APP based on? And then go into the details of what we aim to achieve uh, during the course of this 2022-23 financial year. Uh, with your permission, uh, Honourable Chair, can we invite uh, Dr. Butelezi to come forward? Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Minister. And good morning uh, to the chairperson, uh, honorable uh, members, um, uh, the deputy minister, um, uh, the colleagues and members of the media. Uh, I would like to uh, thank our minister for doing an introductory note uh, to our presentation. Firstly, uh, with your indulgence, Chair, may I introduce uh, the delegation uh, from the Department of Health. Uh, as mentioned, we are accompanying our minister and our deputy minister. And then we are joined by Dr. Nicholas Crisp, who's the Deputy Director General for the National Health Insurance. Uh, we are then also joined by uh, Ms. Valerie Reni, who's our Deputy Director General for Corporate Services. Uh, Mr. Ramperane uh, Morewane, who's the Acting uh, Deputy Director General for Primary Health Care. Dr. Zuki Pinini, who's the Acting uh, DG for HIV TB, STIs, Maternal Child and Women's Health. Dr. Aquina Tulare, who is a technical specialist within the National Health Insurance Unit. Uh, Mr. Andre Fenter, uh, who is the acting chief finance officer. Uh, 
Uh, then we've got uh, uh, Ms. Milani Volmarans, who is the Chief Director for Policy and Planning uh, and also Digital Health Systems. We've got Ms. Tikelet Shabalala, Chief Director, SCM. And uh, we've got Mr. Ayanda Tagela, Chief Director, Infrastructure uh, uh, and Facilities Management. We've got Ms. Pakiso Nematsibanani, who's Chief Director, Forensic Services, and also responsible for hospital uh, services. We've got Ms. Annette Mahongwa, who's uh, the Chief Audit Executive uh, in the department. Then we've got our Chief of Staff, Dr. Walele Seziba, Mr. Hatla, who's our uh, Parliamentary Liaison Officer, uh, and then uh, Rwanda Pretorius, who's from our Police and Planning Unit. And uh, Chair, without wasting time, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Milani Volmarans, uh, who is going to do the first part of the presentation, looking at the APP, the targets, the founding documents, uh, and uh, what do we, or how did we work on the APP and what guided us as we worked on that. Uh, and then uh, at the end, then uh, uh, the Chief Finance Officer, Mr. Andre Fenter, will come in with the figures that will support uh, the, uh, uh, the work that we've put in, in terms of our uh, targets and indicators that uh, we, uh, we will be presenting at this morning. So with the indulgence of the Chair and Honorable Members and the Minister, I would like to hand over to Ms. Milani Volmarans to lead us through the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Um, Honourable Chair, can I continue? Please do, thank you. Um, good morning, um, Honourable Chair and members of the um, Portfolio Committee, Minister, Deputy Minister, TG and the Senior Management of the National Department of Health. Chair, with your permission, I am going to switch off my video just to save the bandwidth, um, if that is fine with you. Yes, please do. You're welcome if you're having a challenge. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as indicated by um, the Director General, I'm going to do just a summary version of the annual performance plan for the 2022-23 financial year. Um, just to start off with the presentation, um, I'm just going to give a little bit of context. Um, so the health um, department or the health sector is included as the government priority two as part of the MPSF 2019-2024. Our vision is a long and healthy life for all South Africans. Um, one of our guiding documents is the National Development Plan. And um, just quoting a section from the National Development Plan that's indicating that the performance of the health, um, South African health system since 1994 has been poor, despite good policy and relatively high spending as a proportion of GDP, services are fragmented between the public and the private sector. And a lot of the interventions that we have included in the National Department of Health um, APP is to look at how do we um, address this um, problem statement. Um, it also indicates that um, it's important that the health system of South Africa um, should be patient focused, where we put the patient at the center rather to continue to focus on a curative and disease focused um, um, health system. Um, with regards to the strategic plan, which was presented to the committee before, um, and the annual performance plan specifically for this um, um, presentation, um, we do have um, a few um, context documents that inform the annual performance plan. First of all, as mentioned in my first slide, it's the National Development Plan as well as the Sustainable Development Goals. And then for this period of government 2019 to 2024, um, the medium term strategic framework serve as the guiding document for the five year building blocks within the 2030 um, National Development Plan. The MTSF has got two um, impact statements. The first one relates to universal health coverage for all South Africans progressively achieved 
and all citizens protected from the catastrophic financial impact of seeking health care by 2030 through the implementation of the national health insurance policy. And the second impact statement is um, the overarching um, impact that we want to achieve with all health sectors, not only the national department, of, but the collective health sector um, interventions is to increase the life expecting, um, expectancies of South Africans to be improved to 70 years by 2030. We recognize the NHI policy directive of government and noting the consultations on the NHI bill, which is currently led by parliament. It also responds to key diagnostics, um, documentation and processes, which is provided um, within the presidential health um, summit comment and um, compact with its nine pillars that includes um, critical interventions um, that's, a, that's been collectively developed through different stakeholders um, um, within the health sector of our country. Then there's also recommendations from the Lancet Quality Commission. There's recommendations from the Health Market Inquiry, as well as the um, um, platform or the, the analysis and report that comes from the South African Demographic and Health Survey. I'm going to go and present um, the key areas of focus for the 2023 um, financial year, um, as it has been included in the annual performance plan, which has been tabled in Parliament. Um, the first program is program one, um, administration. Um, program one focuses on um, the support services for the functioning of the National Department of Health. And um, these include um, the human resources, um, development and management. Um, in other words, the staff of the National Department of Health, labor relations services, information and communication technology services to ensure that we can have the teams meetings and so forth and other um, ICT support for the functioning of the National Department of Health, property management services, security services, legal services, supply chain management, as well as financial management services. But in program one, um, the first indicator um, relates to the um, audit outcome from the Auditor General of South Africa and um, the target for 2023 is to receive an unqualified audit opinion for the 2021-22 financial year. Um, then the next two indicators relates to medical and legal. Um, the first indicator is um, to prepare and develop legislation to manage medical legal claims in South Africa. And the next one is to continue with the rollout of the case medical legal case management system um, to be implemented in, um, in eight of the nine provinces. Um, this currently excludes the Western Cape um, as they are not participating in the process when the tender was um, 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 awarded um, accordingly. Um, the next indicator is with regards to the continuous um, communication with the public um, for preventative um, uh, measures and specifically targeting at the um, reduction of um, the premature mortality due to NCDs and um, to use our extensive social media platform to engage with the public. And for that, we have targeted 100 um, different health promotion mess messages that the National Department of Health will um, place and manage on the social, social media platform. <clears throat> the next set of indicators um, refer first to employment equity, um, with a target of 50% of women at the senior management level to be appointed. 30% um, at the National Department of Health, 30% of youth to be appointed at the National Department of Health, and 7% of people with disabilities to be appointed at the National Department of Health. And this in the key focus areas as included in the APP for Program 1. If we move to Program 2, um, Program 2 um, is the National Health Insurance, and um, the purpose of this program is to improve access to quality health services through the development and implementation of policies to achieve um, universal health coverage and health financing reform. Mm -hmm. Program two, the first um, 
focus or um, intervention and, and objective and target is with regards to the legislative framework for the establishment of the NHI fund. And um, during the 2022-23 financial year, the National Department of Health will continue to participate in the um, public hearings as it relates to the NHI bill. And it's currently led by Parliament and its structures and continue to um, support that process um, accordingly and as it is um, prescribed. Um, the next um, two indicators refers to the availability of medicines. Um, so the first um, one refers to the expansion of the um, Central Chronic Medication Dispensing and Distribution Program where the target is to increase the number of people that um, participate or is registered in this um, program, that um, that be increased by an additional 1.3 million um, um, patients um, that's on chronic medication. <clears throat> the next one is with regards to the establishment of the NHI office at the National Department of Health with a focus of 70% of the funded post in the NHI organogram to be filled um, during this financial year. And then um, one of the next um, indicator refers to the monitoring and um, of the availability of medicines um, in health facilities. Um, and this is where in both at the district level, provincial level, as well as the national level, at the facility, we through the system that are being implemented, we can monitor the availability of, of the different medicines at each one of the facilities. So currently it's implemented in 3,830 health facilities, and um, this will be increased um, with 20 during the 2023 financial year. This is the end of the National Health Insurance Program. I will now move to program three, which is the bulk of the APP, and um, this refers to communicable and non-communicable diseases. It focuses on the development and the support of the implementation of all the national policies, all the national guidelines, norms and standards, and monitoring the achievement of the different targets that are being set by the provinces, um, and um, also with a focus on decreasing morbidity and mortality, which is associated with communicable diseases, as well as non-communicable diseases. And it also is responsible for the development of strategies and programs to reduce maternal and child mortality. The first set of indicators refers to HIV. So um, it's a new intervention um, in terms of the implementation of HIV self-screening at facilities. And for the 2022-23 financial year, the target is to implement that program in 200 public sector facilities. Um, also, a new indicator is um, the implementation of focused men's health services. Um, and this will be piloted at 10 facilities. Um, and this is um, to improve access to health services um, specifically for men. Um, and then the next one is with regards to the youth. Um, currently, the youth zones are implemented in 1,600 primary health care facilities. And during the 2022-23 financial year, we will increase that by an additional 400 um, primary health care facilities working with the provinces um, to, to have youth, youth zones established at the primary health care facilities. The next set of indicators refers to TB. Um, so the first one is um, relating to the TB treatment success rate. The estimated performance for the previous financial year was 80%, and um, the target is to increase that with 5%, um, with a target of 85% for the 2023 um, um, financial year. Continuing with TB, um, it, the focus area is the reduction on the number of drug susceptible um, TB deaths. Um, and based on the um, data available, um, the, it look, uh, the um, information is that um, there is 14,853 
um, deaths that is related to drug assistable TB deaths. Um, and um, the target is to reduce this with approximately 2,500 um, implementing critical interventions in terms of the TB program to um, reduce these um, deaths um, with um, 2000, approximately 2,500. <clears throat> also, with regards to the, um, the number of people started on treatment, um, they, it's new people to be started on treatment. So the estimated performance for the previous financial year was 190,000. Um, this will be increased in the 2022-23 financial year to 221,900 um, people to be started on TB treatment. The next part of the indicators relates to um, child health. Um, so one of the um, key um, programs um, for the prevention of childhood diseases is um, the expanded program on immunization. Um, the effectiveness of this is reliant on um, the cold chain capacity that's available um, through the supply or chain of the, the vaccines. This includes the depots, the sub depots, and all the um, facilities. So what we are um, looking at, and this needs to be audited and ensured that we do not have a break in the cold, um, cold chain um, capacity. So um, we are going to start with an annual audit um, to look at the um, cold chain capacity. Um, yes. Um, Please continue. Thank you. Um, so in all the depots and um, the sub depots and 50% of the public sector hospitals with a report that will be sent um, approved by the Director General communicated with the provinces in order to be able to ensure that the provinces can provide the corrective um, measures. Then um, there's a program that's being implemented um, using radio stations um, um, promoting child health with a specific focus on child nutrition. Um, and it's a program that will be implemented. It's a 36 episode um, program that will be broadcasted in 10, over, in 10 radio stations. Um, the next is with regards to the um, monitoring and implementation, working with the provinces to implement um, corrective um, measures where as part of our monitoring processes as the National Department of Health, we find that um, the provinces are not um, reaching their targets as set in their provincial plans. And for this purpose, there will be quarterly review sessions with each one of the nine provinces reviewing um, the child, youth and school health program and also the women, maternal and reproductive health program. Then also a program that is implemented um, started in the 2023 um, financial year is um, the training of clinicians um, with regards to sexual and reproductive health. And the target is for 400 clinicians to complete um, one of the sexual reproductive health online training module um, in terms of improving the capacity to deal with sexual and reproductive health. The next three um, focus areas is with regards to the COVID-19 vaccination program. Um, we have set these targets. Um, this is what we would like to achieve. We do have the vaccines. We do have the vaccination sites. We do have the vaccinators. However, it is around the public um, coming forward to be vaccinated. And therefore at the back end, there is quite a lot of um, programs that are being implemented, mobilizing um, the South African public to come forward for vaccination. The targets are 75% of adults 50 years and older vaccinated against COVID-19 um, for at least one dose. 65% of adults 35 to 49 years vaccinated against COVID-19 with at least one dose. We group the two younger populations um, to include the adolescents as well as the youth or the younger population, um, 12 to 34 years, 60% of them vaccinated against COVID-19 with at least one dose. Um, the next um, program is with regards to um, the Schisto 
to MEASA's mass drug implementation plan to be implemented and um, to be implemented in, in schools um, in terms of um, the program, having the plan um, to be developed and then facilitate the implementation of the plan at, um, at the provincial level. Um, then with regards to malaria, um, the target is to have two targeted sub-districts um, reporting zero local, local malaria cases. One is in Mpumalanga, and the sub-district targeted is Tabochweo, and um, the one sub other sub-district is in KwaZulu-Natal, and the sub-district targeted for zero local malaria cases is King Shechwayo. And then um, if we look at the outcome of um, um, reducing the premature mortality due to non-communicable diseases to be reduced um, to 26%, um, that requires us a 10% reduction, um, as it's also indicated in the medium-term strategic framework so over the five-year period. Um, so again, it is to work with the provinces, identifying critical areas um, that needs intervention as it is relates to the national strategic plan for addressing non-communicable diseases. The next indicators is with regards to mental health. Um, we are aware that there is pressure on the number of beds um, for state patients. So the target for the 2022-23 um, is to have um, an increase on the new um, 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 bed or capacity available for the admission of state patients into designated psychiatric hospitals. And then also um, the development and um, finalization of the national mental health policy framework um, that requires revision um, to be tabled and approved by the National Health Council. Um, with regards to the food service policy, um, the target is for additional 100 hospitals, including seven tertiary hospitals, to obtain at least a 75% and above um, assessment score on the um, food services um, policy. Um, that's the target for 2023. And then the last indicator um, on this is to develop the strategy together with um, in partnership and together with stakeholders, um, develop a st strategy of interventions um, to continue with the prevention and control of obesity in South Africa. And that will then be developed as well as published. <clears throat> that brings me to the end of program three. And we will now move to program four, which is primary health care. Um, the primary health care program is also looking at the legislation, policy, systems, and norms and standards for the um, implementation of a uniform, well-functioning district health services. And this program also includes emergency health services as well as environmental health services. The key focus areas for the 2022-23 financial year, um, first of all, is um, to look at um, the status of implementation um, of the district health systems policy framework, um, that which was for the period 2014 to 2019, and to do a comprehensive evaluation report with recommendations um, towards the next phase of the implementation and consolidation of the district health system in South Africa, which is part of also the preparation for national health insurance. Um, linked to that is also the establishment of fully fledged um, district health management offices. Um, detailed guidelines has been developed and um, this will now be tested within 18 districts, identified districts, health districts in the country. The next two indicators focus on community-based services. Um, the first one is around the expansion on um, the primary healthcare facilities with ward-based primary healthcare outreach teams, where um, it will be increased um, in this financial year from 1,250 facilities with ward-based outreach teams to 2,700 during the 2022 or by the end of the 2022-23 financial year. Um, and then um, the next critical area is um, 
and we experienced it also during um, COVID, is to identify and follow up um, individuals, patients, clients that were put on to TB, TB treatment as well as HIV treatment and um, use the community health worker caters together with the um, ward-based outreach teams to identify um, these individuals and bring them back into um, the treatment regime. The target for the 22-23 um, financial year is 350,000 individuals. <clears throat> The next um, group of indicators refers to environmental health. The first one is um, with regards to the ports of entry and their compliance with the international health regulations. Um, and um, a program has been implemented to, to um, for self-assessment of each one of these um, ports of entry. Um, it has been implemented in the previous financial year in 18 ports of entry. It will be expanded to 25 ports of entry during the 2022-23 financial year. And then um, the next um, indicator is with regards to the assessment of um, both all the metros as well as the um, 20, uh, total of metros and district municipalities, 26 of them to be assessed um, for compliance to the national environmental health norms and standards with a report and recommendations with regards to improvement of areas um, around compliance with the normative standard of environmental health. Um, the last indicator is with regards to emergency medical services. And again, this is to look at compliance with the emergency medical services regulations that has been published and um, work with the provinces to prepare um, plans for corrective measures. The next program is program five. Um, its name is hospital services. It covers two main areas, which is the quality improvement for hospitals, and then the big component with regards to the um, health infrastructure and also the National Tertiary Services Conditional Grant falls under this program. With regards to hospital services, um, it is to revise and relook at the um, 2014 regulations that was published with regards to the designation classification of hospitals will be reviewed and it will be published for comment um, and for implementation or for approval. Um, the next um, indicators refers to the infrastructure um, um, interventions. Um, just to indicate to the members of the committee that um, in the APP from page 191 to page 93, there are details of the 40 facilities as indicated in the second row and the 21 hospitals as well as the ones for maintenance that's in the next slide. So um, facilities and um, the um, indication of, of um, identifying facilities for construction and revitalization goes through a process um, which is required um, a policy from government that any infrastructure um, programs um, needs to go through the user asset management plans where it goes through a process of assessing that and for that purpose, um, it will go through the process and 40 facilities have been identified through this process for construction and revitalization. And similarly, um, for the hospitals, um, there is 21 hospitals that um, for construction, that's what, um, if there's a new hospital or for revitalization, where there's additional um, fun um, features that needs to be con included um, with regards to the hospitals. And then the last one is with regards to the 120 public health facilities um, that will um, be um, maintained with the maintenance program, as well as rep reparations that needs to be done or um, critical refurbishment. This 120 public hospitals is um, including clinics, hospitals, nursing colleges, EMS base stations, et cetera. And as indicated on page 91 to 93, there is details with regards to um, the specific facilities that will be covered under the infrastructure program. 
The last program is program six, um, which um, covers um, planning, monitoring, and evaluation. It also um, um, focuses on the human resources for health program, looking at the different healthcare professionals um, and support staff, um, and also the nursing um, strategy component that's included in terms of the interventions as it relates to the nursing strategy. And then it also includes um, the oversight um, of the public entities as well as the statutory health professional councils. With regards to the key focus areas for 2022-23, um, the first indicator relates to our oversight function as it pertains to the entities as well as the, and the second one, as it refers to the governance of the statutory health um, professional councils and the public entities, um, where we will um, prepare a biannual governance report um, for each one of the statutory councils as well as the public entities. The first indicator is to ensure that the boards for the two entities whose um, board term, board, the term of the boards are expiring, um, that the boards are appropriately appointed. Um, and that is the South African Medical Research Council and the Office of Health Standard Compliance. With regards to the training of nurses, um, this is to expand the nursing program and continue with the development of the um, nursing training program. Um, the National Department of Health will support nine nursing colleges um, to develop training plans for um, the nurse and midwife um, specialist program. With regards to monitoring and evaluation, um, as per the National Health Act, the National Department of Health is um, required to publish on an annual basis the revised set of health research priorities um, that will be produced and um, working with the Health Research Council. Um, and then to work on the development of a performance dashboard that um, is from a district lab level aggregated to a provincial level aggregated to a national level to continuously monitor even at a, at a lower level than just at the national level the performance of um, the health system as it pertains to critical um, health service indicators. Um, and then um, 100 uh, in terms of the broader quality improvement program. Um, there's a target of 100 primary healthcare facilities and 80 hospitals implementing the National Health Quality Improvement Program. The intention is to establish centers of excellence as it pertains to quality implementation and have an exchange program so that other facilities and management can learn from these centers of excellence in order to be able to replicate programs in other facilities. Um, with regards to the ideal clinic program, um, currently, or the estimated performance for 2021-22 is 2,100 primary healthcare facilities that qualify as ideal clinics. Um, the target for 2022-23 is to increase that with an additional 100 primary healthcare facilities. With regards to human resources for health, um, the review of the community service policy um, with a recommendation to be finalized during this financial year. It's a fairly complex um, um, process and program and that this final report and recommendations be presented to the technical committee of the National Health Council and then eventually with, um, for consideration to the National Health Council. And then the National Department of Health um, over the past three years developed a um, fairly robust human resources information system, um, which is um, giving a platform where the human resources for health um, um, give details around the availability of human resources, the health human resources. And to expand this, the target for this financial year is to expand the utilization of this platform in the context of human resources for health planning. Um, this is the end of the key focus areas for the 2023 um, financial year. And with your permission, Chairperson, I will hand over to the acting CFO to continue with the budget. Thank you. Andre. Um, 
Good morning, Chair. Uh, with your permission, I will also mute my audio just uh, video just to make sure that I'm audible during the presentation due to load shedding. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chairperson, I think it's important for the honourable members to take note that the total budget allocation, um, Milani, if you can, uh, if the total budget allocation for the 22-23 financial year uh, is 64.5 billion rands, and that is to ensure that we do achieve the targets set out in the APP. Just uh, for information, when we compare the 22-23 budget allocation against the final budget allocation, and that is after the adjustments uh, took place in the 21-22 financial year, there is a slight reduction of 877 million rands, or 1.34%. So as indicated by Minister, uh, we as the National Department of Health is actually very grateful for the, the small reduction that we have uh, received compared to other sectors and other departments who received a higher budget reduction due to the economical uh, climate in currently in South Africa and due to the pandemic. Chair, uh, the total allocation uh, as awarded by the National Treasury uh, in the letter of allocation uh, ring-fenced allocations for earmarked funds, conditional grants, and indirect grants. Uh, in total, that amounts to 63.1 billion rands, or 97.8% of the budget allocated to the National Department of Health. As indicated by uh, Minister, the greater portion of the budget, which is 56.2 billion rands, or 87.2%, is allocated to conditional grants and the actual expenditure for those activities will realize uh, at provincial level. And we do have our monitoring systems in place and frequent uh, meetings and engagement with provinces to ensure that uh, defense are being uh, directed into the areas as stipulated in the Division of Revenue Act and the business plans which have been approved by uh, NDOH. Chairperson, uh, we will, I will then present the, the financial or the financial resources uh, in accordance with the categories, uh, just for members to, to understand how the budget at national is, is composed uh, in relation to the APP. So we have a voted fence, which is the fence basically for the, the core functions of the NDOH and uh, these funds, we as the NDOH do have discretion to do vitamins and shifting of funds in the course of the financial year, as it might be required uh, due to change in priorities. Then we have the earmarks uh, allocations, uh, which is earmarked by National Treasury, and there we cannot touch those funds. Those funds are completely ring fenced and it cannot be changed without approval from Treasury uh, together with parliamentary approval. Uh, likewise, with the conditional grants, those funds flows to, to provinces. Uh, so, so the Department of Health, the National Department of Health is managing these grants and ensuring that it is indeed uh, directed into those areas that we have agreed upon with, with the provinces. And then we have the indirect grants sitting at the National Department of Health. These funds will be spent by the National Department of Health, but once again, those are strictly earmarked and, and cannot be used for any other purpose except for what it was uh, appropriated for. And then we have a total uh, for a department which amounts to the 64.5 billion range chair. So we, I also presented the program just to have a feel uh, in terms of the APP, uh, what portion of the budget is allocated to the various programs. So program one, we will sit with the 781 uh, million rands. Uh, as indicated, that is basically for the support services of the National Department of Health. And then we have the NHI National Health Insurance sitting at 1.5 billion rands, of which 693 million is a conditional grant, and the 700 will be spent at the National Department for the indirect grants. Uh, communicable and non 
communicable diseases. We are sitting with a total budget of 26.9 billion rands, of which 24.1 billion rands is conditional grants uh, and 2.6 billion is earmarked funds. Pri uh, primary health care, we have a total of 5.1 billion rands, 4.8 billion rands, a conditional grant going to the provinces. Hospital systems sitting at 22.6 billion rands, 21, 21 billion rands going to the provinces as conditional grants for the facilities revitalization grant, and the 1.5 billion at the national department for indirect grants. And then lastly, we have the health systems, governance, and human resources totaling at 7.5 billion rands, of which 5.4 billion rands conditional grant as well as 1.9 billion rands sitting at uh, earmarked funds. Chair, then traditionally we, uh, in terms of the standards of, of treasury and reporting systems, we also uh, craft the budget in terms of the economical classifications. So in terms of economical classification, compensation of employees, the total allocation is 787 million rands, goods and services sitting at 3.9 billion rands. And then the transfers, and this is where the, the, the bulk sits in terms of conditional grants, is sitting at 58.3 billion rands. And then our capital, which includes the infrastructure, indirect grants sits at 1.4 billion rands, totaling once again uh, to 64.5 billion rands. On the voted side, we have at the national 1.379 billion rands, the earmark is 4.6 billion, the conditional grants 56.2 billion, and then 2.2 billion going into the indirect grants. Chair, uh, let me move to program, uh, before I get to that, uh, at a high level, Reasons for variances, uh, I've, I've mentioned that uh, there is a slight decrease in our budget allocation compared to the final budget allocation for 2021-22. Uh, on the economical classification, the compensation of employees was reduced by 7%. However, that is mainly due to the fact that the forensic chemistry laboratories uh, moved over to the NHLS uh, as from the 1st of April 2022, uh, and, and that represents the reduction. Then on goods and services, Chair, uh, as we all know that COVID-19, uh, there was, uh, it was a, a relief funding that we've received in the previous budgets, and, and therefore for the current financial year, the budget is reduced from 4.3 billion rand for the free previous financial year into 2.1 billion rands for the current year. However, Jay, this is mainly for the procurement of vaccines, but uh, Treasury has already indicated that should we uh, experience any pressures in, in this area, that they have made provision for additional allocation that can be allocated to the department in the course of the financial year, and that will be then taken up in the adjustments budget. Furthermore, in the goods and services, uh, some of the funds that was allocated to the NHI indirect grant was reallocated to the uh, direct grant uh, for NHI, which will then flow to the provinces, and then uh, the human resource and training grant uh, also benefited from the reallocation of the funds. And then, Chair, we have on our transfers and subsidies uh, an increase in the conditional grant uh, due to the reallocation of the NHI uh, indirect grant to the NHI direct grant and the human resource training grant. And, and that was mainly to, to, to cater for the statutory post uh, that we continuously suffer to have sufficient budget to, to cover that expenditure. And then an additional amount of 758 million rands was allocated to the conditional grant for cash gratuity payments for those health workers who served the country uh, extremely well during the pandemic. Uh, and then lastly, Chair, we have the purchase and capital assets, um, the capital funds for the health revitalization and national health insurance indirect grants were increased by 19%. Uh, from 1.1 to 1.3 billion and 65% respectively in 
from 19 million to 53 uh, million rands from 21-22 to 22-23 financial year. Chair, if, if we then go into the programs uh, in line with the APP as presented by Milani, uh, for program one, uh, a total budget is allocated of 781 million rands, and I think it's just important to, to list out here the earmarked amount for medical legal committees or the function that is being performed uh, at national to ensure that the system uh, is there for medical legal so that we can uh, manage those claims appropriately and, and ensure that uh, the, the system is not being abused. So, so that money is set aside for the medical legal function at national. And then uh, another earmarked amount is currently called SICA program, but it's, it's more on the financial management support national is providing to the provincial health departments to ensure that we do have improved outcomes in audits but also to ensure that we do maintain adequate and proper systems in supply chain and to make sure that we are in line with what is the requirements from, from National Treasury to ensure that we have a very efficient and effective uh, utilization of resources. Then we also have, uh, once again, just the, the presentation in terms of the economical classifications out of the total allocation, 245 million will go towards uh, compensation of employees, goods and service, sitting at the uh, 494 million rands, uh, and then the earmarks of 23 million rands, uh, then the total amount sitting at 781 million rands for a program one administration. If we move to program two, National Health Insurance, which is now a, a very important program in the National Department of Health, uh, we do have, and, and we're very fortunate, Chair, that we did receive adequate funding for the current financial year to, to proceed with the implementation of the NHI. And there we have received uh, in total 700 million rands. That is an indirect grant that will sit at national, uh, where national department will spend these funds in ensuring the, the implementation of, of NHI. Then we have 693 million rands, Chair, going into the conditional grants also for NHI. Uh, these funds will be spent at provincial level uh, and ensuring that uh, the services being rendered uh, is in line with, with what we are planning on, on NHI and, and getting everything ready for NHI. Okay, we have earmarked funds of, of 67 million rands, uh, mainly the, the electronic medicine stock system that we have at national uh, sitting at 10 million rands. And then we have the traditional um, NHR interim uh, fund management. And this is basically to capacitate and ensure that we do have a structure to implement uh, what is required in terms of the NHI fund sitting at 41 million rands. And then we have the uh, NHI health technology assessment, 15 million rands, which is also very critical for NHI. Uh, going forward. In total, Chair, we have 1.5 billion rand sitting in the program two uh, for the National Health Insurance Program. Uh, once again, on the next slide is just an indication of how that is spread across the economical classifications, uh, of which compensation of employees will get 45 uh, million rands. Uh, our Goods and services will get 24 for national, 67 million for the uh, earmarked funds, and 646 million rands for the indirect grants. And then we have our transfer, which is the uh, conditional grants going to province for the NHI, 693 million, in total 1.5 billion rands allocated to program two. Uh, program three, Che. Um, Melani, we can move that. Communicable and non-communicable diseases, Chair. A total budget allocation of 26.9 billion rands. Chair, I think it's important for members uh, who compare previous year's budget allocations uh, just for them to take note 
that the HIV TB Malarian Community Outreach Services Grant uh, was renamed uh, in the current year to District Health Programs Grant. So, so this grant consists of two components, of which one component is represented in program three, and, and that is the comprehensive HIV and AIDS component, which is created, and uh, that is mainly for the HIV and the TB components uh, of this grant. And that amounts to a 24.1 billion range G, um, which is uh, transferred and, and, and managed by the provinces uh, with oversight from the National Department of Health. And then we have earmarked funding, uh, which is also a substantial amount uh, going into some of our NGOs, uh, LifeLife, Lifeline, Soul City, uh, SANEC, uh, and then the in, uh, in, uh, HIV and AIDS NGOs. And then we also have our condom budget sitting there at 55 million rands is also earmarked uh, as previously indicated, Chair, that uh, none of these funds can be uh, utilized by the National Department of Health. It is specifically and exclusively earmarked. Chair, under the COVID vaccine program, we've got 2.1 billion rands, mainly for the procurement of vaccines for COVID-19. Um, given our current stock levels, uh, we might not consume that full amount, but in the event of changes, which, which is unpredictable and we never know, uh, should there be a shortage, uh, as I've indicated, Treasury has already made provision for that, and that should not be uh, a challenge for the department. Uh, we have the Malaria Elimination Program project sitting at 27 million range chair, and then we have the chronic diseases and prevention and health promotion earmarked funding sitting at 48 million rands. And this is what we usually call at national the sugar tax uh, allocation. And th these are the funds that uh, we receive from Treasury uh, due to the change in the uh, sugar tax levy uh, that was uh, introduced. In total, we have uh, 26.9 billion rands for program three. Uh, and I've indicated that the majority of these funds is conditional grants, 24.1 billion rands going out to the provinces. Um, once again, Chair, we uh, also allocate this and, and reflect it according to the uh, economical classifications, uh, which is then uh, for the COE, Milan, if you can just scroll to the next slide, please. Uh, COE will have a budget of 104 million uh, rands. Goods and services for the voted at the National Department, uh, 61 million. And then earmarks sitting at a 2.3 billion rands. Transfers uh, voted sitting at uh, three, 3 million rands and then 205 million for earmarks. And then the conditional grant sitting at 24.1 billion rands chair. That is taking us to the total allocation of 26.9 billion rands. If we move to program four, primary health care services, uh, Chair, I've indicated that uh, the, the former grant was renamed to be the district, district Health Programs Grant. So the first component, uh, the, the HIV component is sitting in the program three, uh, three. And here in the program four sits the, the district health component. Uh, which is uh, covering the community outreach services, malaria elimination, uh, HP, HPV vaccines, uh, and a allocation for COVID-19, uh, purely for provinces administering the vaccines and the functions that they are doing at a provincial level uh, to, to cover those costs. Uh, in the previous financial year, it was sitting at 1.5 billion rands. And this is just to ensure that it's not necessary for provinces to absorb any additional cost uh, coming from the COVID-19 pandemic uh, impacting on their budget allocations. And that's that's provision that was made for, for uh, the grant uh, or, or component in the grant. So in total, it's 4.8 billion range chair that will be going out to the provinces uh, for a conditional grant. Uh, once again, we reflect that uh, composition and the uh, economical classifications chair, and I think it's 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 quite straightforward. 
in terms of the, the large amount that's going into the conditional grants program 5G. Uh, program 5 is our hospital systems. Uh, once again, uh, the, the, the greater part of the allocation to program five is for conditional grants, 6.7 billion rands going into the revitalization grant and the uh, NTSG grant sitting at 14.3 billion rands, totaling to 21 billion rands going into conditional grants to provinces G. I think just to note here, which is fairly, fairly uh, uh, important and, and that is really uh, giving a good uh, indication of, of the priorities. Limpopo Academic Hospital, we have once again the uh, indirect grant of 498 million rands, meaning that it's funds under the national supervision and responsibility to spend those funds in, in ensuring that uh, the Limpopo Academic Hospital is indeed uh, uh, getting the attention that it's required to, to ensure that we do uh, Build the hospital there, J. Uh, I think in total that is sufficient. Uh, Twenty-one point zero eight five billion going into the conditional grants, totaling twenty-two point six billion rands for the hospital services uh, budget. J. The last program, program six, uh, our human uh, our health system governance and human resources. I think. Let me. Just lift out here once again the health professionals and training uh, development grant sitting at 5.4 billion rands. Once again, it will go out to the provinces. And as I've indicated, there was a, a slight increase of 133 million rands to make provision for our statu statutory uh, posts, which we all know here on here that remains a huge struggle to, to find adequate funding uh, for, for this activity. However, there is con continuous engagements with National Treasury to, to ensure that we do not run once again into challenges with regard to this grant. Uh, we also have the earmarked fundings uh, for Program 6, uh, which, which is really important. And, and Milani did indicate uh, and alluded that in, in her presentation, the health information, the district health information system, uh, which have an earmarked funding of 15 million rands. Uh, we have health system stress sitting at 17 million rands as, as an earmarked funding. Uh, and then we have our traditional public entities, which is still getting a contribution from the National Department of Health, so Office of Health Standards Compliance, uh, National Health Laboratory Services, which now will include the Forensic Chemistry Laboratories, the MRC, and SAPRA is also uh, getting the, the, let me call it a subsidy from, from National Department side. And Chair, then we have uh, the traditional health practices, practitioners council. Um, this is also an area where we still need additional funding and we are in consultation and discussions with National Treasury on this specific item, uh, which is sitting at 4.6 billion rands. And then we have the CCOD, MBOD sub program sitting at 63 uh, million rands. Chain total, the allocation for program six is sitting at 7.5 billion rands, of which uh, 110 million rands is voted funds and uh, under the discretion of the National Department of Health. And then lastly, Chair, the last slide from, from my side is once again just uh, indicating how this 7.5 billion rands is allocated according to the economical classifications. Um, and uh, once again, it, it's evident that 1.9 billion rands is earmarked. We cannot touch that. It's specifically allocated. And then the 5.4 billion rands will go out as a conditional grant. Chair, uh, that's all from, from the finance side. More details, and I think a, a lower level information will be provided in the budget vote by the minister. Uh, we thought let's just give the, the resource envelope uh, to, to the members so that we can understand how will we achieve the targets as set out in the APP. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Minister. Um, Chairperson, this is the end of the presentation, and I'm handing over back to the Director General. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much uh, to the team.
um, uh, we will end our presentation here and our, uh, I will hand over to our minister. Thanks. Well, uh, Chair, that concludes the presentation. Uh, we uh, will be ready to take any questions uh, from the honorable members. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister and uh, DG and CFO and Ms. Bomarans uh, for the presentation. Um, it's going to be a little bit uh, long because we have quite a number of members who want to raise some uh, questions with you and also get a discussion going. So I'll go straight on to it. This honorable members Ismail, Ella, Munyai, Clark, Van Staden, Tembequail, Abad, Klengwa, Chirwa, Ziwela, Sukers, Wilson. I'm going to repeat Ismail, Gela, Munyai, Clark, Van Staden, Tembequail, Abad, Klengwa, Chirwa, Ziwela, Sukers, Wilson. Honorable members, it is now 10.45. Um, I'm not really going to restrict um, the time in terms of uh, uh, to make it earlier than what we had anticipated. So, uh, but please still be mindful. I think it would not be correct to, to you know, have 15, 20 questions each. Um, then you can imagine where we're going to end up today. So let us then choose our questions in, uh, in uh, terms of priority. And uh, hopefully uh, we would be able to finish on time. Ms. Majalamba, I think that is, uh, we were planning on finishing at 1300 hours, I think, if I am correct. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much. So, honorable members, uh, I have noticed some of you are struggling with uh, load shedding. When it does, uh, when your time uh, does arrive to speak and you're not there, I'll just move on to somebody else and come back to you at, uh, at a later time. Thank you very much. In that order, you may raise your questions and your discussion points. Thank you. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for the presentation to the department and to the minister and his team. I must say the presentation is very interesting. I have a variety of questions. I'll try and keep it short and quick as possible. So my first question, slide 12. Under the outcome maternal, child, infant, and neonatal mortality is being reduced, what is the reasons for 2023, 2024, 2024, 2025 years stating not applicable? Will this program be then removed? Is there no target for this program in that year? My second question, the backlog of forensic psychiatric evaluations was 1450 and 200 for state patients waiting for hospital admission in detention centers. Now the most affected provinces were Eastern Cape, Gauteng and KZN. How many new psychiatric hospitals are in the plan for 2022, 2023 and 2024, 2025 financial years? My third question, I note and are not applicable in certain in one column with regard to a national mental health policy framework being developed. Now next year it is due to be tabled. Why is this year left empty? Has the department actually finalized the replacement for the national mental, mental health policy framework and strategic plan 2013 to 2020? Or is this still being worked on? My next question, what programs are being put in place and what budget is being allocated towards the prevention treatment and the treatment of substance abuse, including alcohol, is stated in the Sustainable Development Goals. My next question, please can you provide or advise uh, on the department's cancer campaign and the impact of COVID-19 on it? You know, tell us more on uh, the oncology services improvement plan, as well as the obstetric services improvement plan. This is very important, you know, as we know in Gauteng particularly, we have a major issue with, uh, you know, uh, cancer patients not being uh, adequately equipped because of the uh, Charlotte Makeke Hospital closing down. Now, with regard to human resources, there are still cases of interns and community service doctors is not being placed timely. 
what are the reasons for this? And will the increases in these grant allocations assist to prevent this? I note in your presentation, you have some plans where you're trying to mitigate uh, future problems, but right now, what what you know what is going to be assisting is the grant allocations going to assist for this now under the nhi what has the department learned from the covid 19 pandemic and how will this learning be incorporated in the running of the department and the design of the nhi in particular you know please update us on the process of medical aid beneficiaries being registered on the hprs system and I see here one of the department's outputs is to ensure the 70% of funded posts in the NHI onogram are filled. Please, can you share the onogram with the committee so that at least we know and we updated, you know, we're in the loop of what is going on. Just on this point as well, the department claims that more than 50 million people are registered on its HBRA system. How was this actually achieved? You know, did the department work with the Department of Home Affairs? Uh, has it got a proper database now? Is it actually Popeye compliant? You know, we would like to get a report on, on the spending of the NHI grant presently and where we are going with this. Quickly, under primary health care, the program budget has increased significantly. Is this program sufficiently capacitated in terms of human resources to spend and deliver services accordingly? How will the district health services be affected by the increase in budget? I'm really worried about the EMS services. You know, can the department provide a detailed report on the state of the EMS services in the country presently? And on nursing colleges, you know, please can the department provide a progress report on the training of nurses and the establishment of nursing colleges in the country? And also how did the challenges of changes in the curriculum or training affect the outcomes? And does this new training model actually accommodate and include mental health? Because we know mental health is actually going, to, going forward, uh, you know, especially after COVID, uh, really affecting many, many uh, citizens of South Africa or patients of, uh, in South Africa. Uh, when it comes to vaccines, how much is the country investing in vaccine development? Is there a long-term strategy in place? And how is the department actually supporting the development of vaccines in South Africa? We had a presentation by the South African Medical Research Council, you know, and it's quite interesting to know exactly where the department is actually with all this. And with regard to uh, HIV and AIDS and TB, how is the department measuring effectiveness of its HIV and AIDS and TB prevention campaigns? And how is the HIV program affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? And then my last uh, two questions. Now we know that mining is a big culprit, you know, contributing to TB. And we know that sometimes, or most of the time, departments work in silos. So it's a cross-sectoral initiative of, you know, if is the department working on anything in place, you know, with the DMR and energy and correctional services to address TB in this country, because without, uh, without be having, you know, unilateral discussions and, uh, and responses, we're not going to be actually dealing with the TB, you know, uh, 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 the, uh, TB as 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 a uh, uh, communicable or non communicable disease in the country. We can have a lot of plans to end a TB in 2035, but we don't do something on the ground with other departments. We're not going to reach anywhere. And lastly, malnutrition is a major problem. What strategy is the department implementing to combat severe acute malnutrition? It's important that departments don't work again in silos, you know, but a cross-sectoral approach with departments such as social development, basic education and others, you know, actually sitting down together and working on solutions. Please tell us a bit more on this. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, allow me uh, to not switch on my video camera uh, due to a um, poor network connection. We are having a load shedding. Uh, but Chairperson, I've got a uh, few questions to ask uh, the minister and the department. But firstly, let me appreciate and welcome the presentation uh, that is being presented uh, before us as portfolio committee members. Uh, and also appreciate the good work that the department is doing uh, although we know that uh, there are a lot of uh, challenges, but uh, I think uh, we must also appreciate uh, your commitment, Minister, and also your department. You are there on the ground. We've seen you uh, up and down doing the work, saving the people of South Africa, which we really appreciate. And I think also 
the people of South Africa also appreciate uh, the good work that you are doing. Uh, coming uh, to the questions that I want to ask, as um, we welcomed the consistent advisement of the NHI policy by the ministry and efforts to strengthen our health system, uh, how is the department closing the infrastructure gap a lack of health adequate health worker a capacity and the standards which will be required by the NHI. And when will our public health system in particular be the NHI ready also or drawing from the experience of the NHI pilots? My second question, uh, the recent audit uh, general report uh, reflects, reflected and skewed increase on the cost of uh, medical legal uh, cases in the Eastern Cape, whilst other provinces have been in a relatively low range. Um, what are the specific uh, weaknesses in the Eastern Cape and how is the National Department intervening on the uh, anom anom anomaly. My third question, uh, which is my last question, um, the 2021-2022 performance target on management of medical legal cases uh, targeted seven provinces on managing new medical legal uh, claims, uh, but the current year of 2022, 2023 targets, four of the eight provinces. Uh, why has the target uh, declined and how was the implementation in the previous financial year in the seven provinces? Uh, I'm not going to have many questions uh, because time and time uh, you are also briefing us as a portfolio committee. Uh, but I really appreciate the good work that you are doing. May Almighty God protect you and the team and keep it up, uh, the service that you are doing for the country. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity, um, Honorable Chair. My questions are as follows. Uh, let me just try to to set up my system properly. Um, my question are as follows, uh, Honorable Chair. Number one, South Africa is not is a unitary state, and is not a federal state and all the provinces are required to implement, to implement the national government policy. Why is it that the Western Cape is, ex is, ex is excluded from the promotion uh, from the provinces which need to implement the cases management system of medical cases? Why the Western Cape is excluded from the as one of the provinces which need to implement a cases management system of medical cases. That is the first point, Honorable Minister and Honorable Chair. In relation to the 100 health promotion messages placed on social media on a premature mortality due to NCDs, the department identified YouTube as a target for 2023-2024 and the TikTok is in 2024-2025. The fact of the matter is that the social media platforms are vulnerable to shift as a new innovations are developed. In two years time, new social media platform can be developed. We recommend that the 100 promotional messages uh, should be spread through all possible social media platforms including TikTok and YouTube in the current year. That's our concrete recommendation. The indicator of performance in the area of promoting health messages 
should be target, targeted to the number of audience uh, to ascertain outcomes such as pro, uh, health promotions. What is the targeted reach for the health promotion messages? That is the question. In relation to the state, uh, state pharmaceutical company, Kitla Pila, um, I know this is under the NEXA and the D DMR. How many offtakes has been as a department reach with this company? And how does the department seek to position the company as a critical provider for medicine and other medical products to also encourage domestic manufacturing capabilities? Uh, in relation to the target program three, fund and treat people with TB, TB disease at over 200,000, what is the impact of find and treat program uh, relative to the risk of prevalence of the TB in South Africa? By the way, TB, uh, other than the COVID-19, has been the biggest killer of our, of our people. Why is, why is the department dis, uh, discontinuing the side-by-side -side radio show in the outer years of the MTF? Uh, which, other means, um, which in other means will be used to promote uh, child health and nutri nutrition not in the levels of, a, of a stunning uh, in our country, uh, I mean stunting in our country? That would be very helpful because this radio side by side radio show uh, in a, it is very critical for the promotions of the uh, child uh, children health child health and nutrition so what are the intervention uh, in place to realize the double target for 60% of young people that is 12 to 34 years vaccinated against oh no that's, that's leave that one uh, honorable minister but one critical issue that I want to raise is that let's welcome the, the, the department uh, intervention relative to programs in the APP, but we must put this, uh, uh, this comment that the resources is not limitless. The, all the departments, uh, national department contest for the very same, depart, very same budget. I would have wanted to see more money than what is there now for national health insurance. But understanding the country fiscal position, debt to GDP is almost 87%. There's a lot of debt that the, uh, the Treasury need to pay uh, as, a, as an obligation for this country, and also to intervene in a number of services in the Republic. So within the limited resources, we think the department will do us proud to implement all the programs as anticipated within the APP. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Um, just to apologize, I am now outside trying to do this meeting. We have load shedding, and if I have any animals barking, please excuse that. Um, firstly, what Legislation is referred to on slide six with a reference to managing medical legal claims. And just subsections to that question, please indicate how effective this legislation has been and how has the department managed to reduce these claims? Is there a regu regu regulatory framework in place in terms of legal teams appointed to deal with these claims and the legal charges that um, our lawyers are charging us are these charges kept at a certain rate? Has this legislation been able to curtail the collusion, fraud, and corruption within these processes? And how many disciplinary cases are there? And to what uh, are there? And how has these disciplinary cases been managed? And what is the monetary value in terms of these cases? What consequence management has been put in place in terms of fraud and corruption during these processes? And what are the biggest causes of medical legal claims? And how does these claims impact on the department's budget? The target for the number of registered patients in 2025 is 6.5 million. 
If the NHI is to be implemented in 2025, not even 50% of the population will be registered patients. Will the unregistered patients be denied access to the package of services offered? In slide nine, indicates by 2024, 3,870 health facilities will be available. Has a costing model been done in terms of the staffing of these health facilities? How will the department deal with critical care shortages within the health facilities considering, and this is from a question I asked to Parliament, I got the answer yesterday, that we are short of 21,453 nurses in our healthcare facilities. Um, my colleague has spoken at length in, in terms of the training of nurses, and I won't go into that because those questions have been asked. Then can the department also inform us if the nursing staff that was employed during the height of COVID will be absorbed within the systems um, as we speak about increasing healthcare facilities, as there were many skilled nurses within that pool. Then um, in terms of NHI, we speak about, um, uh, when they did the financial presentation to us this morning, I speak about 1.5 billion rand in total um, allocated for this year. I want to know if, a proper if proper costing has been done in terms of the NHI aligned with the social impact study um, to see what NHI is actually going to cost us. And... Um, you know, in terms of the budget, when the Minister of Finance spoke um, in terms of the budget speech, he, he did not indicate any allocation um, to NHI. And I know that National Treasury has said that um, in this economic climate of South Africa, where we find ourselves in at the moment, um, it's highly unlikely that we're going, to we're going to be able to afford what we need for NHI. So could I have, if any of those studies have been done, then on slide 11, estimated performance for 2021-22 is not applicable. What is the reason for this field being empty? Um, then uh, maternal mortality has increased from 88,3 deaths per 100,000 to 109,8 deaths per 100,000. What plans does government have in place to significantly change the trajectory of the, this st statistic as per objectives on program three? Then in terms of slide 14, how will government ensure that the vaccine programs are strengthened in order to achieve its targets within the APPs? We are seeing a resurgence in the numbers, which is to be expected as we move into our winter months. At this stage, we've seen an increase around 13.4% in stats in the last sort of week or two. Can the department please also keep the committee updated in terms of the increase, not just in terms of stats, but in terms of data and core causes of this increase. Um, slide 16 targets, you speak about implementing a national mental health policy and targets set for patients. How does the department aim in reaching these targets if hospitals are not capacitated to treat mental health patients? And um, how will the capacity be strengthened in order to achieve these outcomes? And then in terms of the NHI, NHI grant, what was the grant spent in, in the last financial year? And what was the amount returned back to National Treasury due to non-expenditure? Um, Chair, I'll stop there because I've got so many questions and I do realize we only have a time limit. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. I keep my video off due to um, power outages. Um, but I only have five questions for today, so I'm, I'm the champion on the <laughs> not the most questions for today. Um, well, question I start. <laughs> Appreciate you. Um, on my first question, uh, what plans does the department have in place to eradicate the vacant post of nurses in state hospitals? But currently amounts to 10,831, as reported by the, the minister to me on the 17th of March, and also the vacant post of doctors. <clears throat> excuse me, doctors, that amounts to 1,359. Uh, my second question, what plans does the department have in place to get rid of corruption in the national department and the provincial departments? I think it's a, 
it's necessary to talk about that matter because it's it's always um, um, have a strange on uh, this department's budget. And with my third question, it seems that there are currently a challenge with mentally health facilities uh, due to the small numbers of availability of such facilities across the country. Um, I just want to know what is currently in the planning stage to get more mental health facilities up and running across the country. We saw what happened also, as my previous colleagues has mentioned, with Charlotte Masek's closure and the pressure which was put on, I think, on Alan Joseph's hospital and the media reports that came out of there. Uh, my fourth question is, what is the latest in terms of legal claims against the department? And in other words, what is the amount currently spent? On, on legal claims. Um, I think it's a matter which also needs to be addressed. And my last question is how many health facilities and in KZN are currently affected by the floods and what is the current pressure of these facilities due to the floods? Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to the department for their presentation. Um, my questions are as follows. Is there a long-term strategy in place for the country to invest in a vaccine development? How is the department supporting the development of vaccines in South Africa and Africa as a continent? How is the country dealing, uh, preparing to deal with other variants of COVID-19 entering the country and possible next wave? Has there been any assessment concluded that the department can share with us pertaining to the impact of April 22 flood on the health system? How is HIV program affected by the COVID-19 pandemic? Has the department modeled the impact what is the implica uh, uh, implication of fewer people receiving testing and treatment this year? And the last one, is there a cross-sectoral approach with the departments such as social development, basic education, and others being utilized pertaining to the department strategy of combating severe malnutrition? Thank you, Chairperson. Honor, honorable Chairs, and, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And also thanks the minister and the team. I have two questions. First one, what are the effects of health care treatment of undocumented migrants on planning and budgeting? And how does the department plan for such circumstances? And what effects does it have on our health capacity? Second question, what programs is the department implementing in relation to digital transformation? Note that the spectrum release will ease access to connectivity, thus creating capacity to digital ties health systems management and other technology innovations. I thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. First of all, let me welcome the briefing by the department. It was very informative and interesting. And yes, it's very informative. Let me switch on my video because on my side is not good. I have a couple of questions, a clarity seeking question, Minister. It is about the mortality in cases and more especially in King Joayo if you can tell us more about that. And still in KZN, how is the National Department intervention on closing of the hospital, an old one, an renovated one, called St. Francis at Matlabatini, at Ulundi, 
and some clinics. Third one, tell us more about the plan of the department in primary health care, more special TB and HIV AIDS treatment in schools. We had about 400 groups of nurses trained, but we want to know where are they, what is their provinces, so that we know exactly these groups comes from. Because now we have a lot of nurses which are lying there at homes, not absorbed, even the doctors. Number five, is there a, a group of health? There is a group of health care called Onompilo. Those people, they go out to door to door, help the, the sick person, but what is their status as of now in KZN? they reject them. We, I want to know the status of these people because now they are desperate, but they are the forefront of the health. I want the intervention of the department in terms of capacity strengthening because some of them are still young, they can absorb be absorbed by the department and go for training as nurses. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and good morning to everyone present in this meeting. Uh, I, I would like the department to report on the obstetric services improvement plan, particularly because of the issue of forced sterilization, firstly. Uh, can we have an update on the healthcare that's also provided or subsequently to that, the healthcare that's been provided to the victims mm -hmm. of the NDOH regarding forced sterilization? We've sent the department their names and contact details uh, of those victims who still suffer consequences of being forcefully sterilized. Has the department contacted any of them and provided them with the necessary healthcare that they need? If not, why is this the case months later? Um, and I also want to follow up on 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 why the department isn't speeding the issue of compensation for the victims of forced sterilization. And on the issue of obstetric violence as well, um, I want to raise again the issue of surgical mesh and in particular, transvaginal mesh. I, I've been raising it for quite some time now and I even asked the department together with SAPRA to investigate the situation because the FDA evoked the use of transvaginal mesh, and there's other countries who evoked the use of transvaginal mesh. Um, and in South Africa, it's still being, still being done, despite the issues that have been raised time and time and again. In other countries like Canada, there's uh, corrective surgeries being done to people who suffer um, from having transvaginal mesh inserted into them. Can, can I have an update on that particular thing and what the department has done since I've raised it months ago? Um, together with the issue of Pindle Mnube. And then, because uh, I think all of this, this particular thing also falls under the issue of obstetric violence. And I think the department isn't taking issues of obstetric violence quite seriously. Um, and and, and, and in, in relation to that as well, termination of pregnancy is, is not available in three provinces, Eastern Cape being one of them. Uh, can the minister tell us or the department tell us when will this be resolved? Because it cannot be that there's three provinces in this country where women don't have access to terminating pregnancies and they have to travel outside of their provinces to have access to termination of pregnancies. And another issue, the NHLS um, reported that they were able to insource cleaners and security guards, um, which is something that we've asked them to do since 2019. They, they eventually did it. I want to find out from the department uh, because we've also been raising the issue of insourcing of cleaners and security guards with them as well. What is the pro, what is the what is the update on that? Is there an intention to do that from the department? And if so, 
when, when will we see this pro- process unfolding? And if not, why isn't this being considered? Especially noting the exploitation that uh, they go through through these tendering companies who don't pay them what they're supposed to be paid, who and they don't have uh, benefits of workers, but these people work for the Department of Health, essentially. Um, and uh, okay, the issue of neonatal deaths was raised, I think, by a previous speaker. Um, can you also please update the, the committee regarding the, the fire at Charlotte Macquarie Hospital and, and its restoration to services? There, there are reports also uh, in relation to that. There are reports of a cancer treatment crisis in Gauteng following the fire at Charlotte Macquarie Hospital. What is the department doing to mitigate the, the impact? And uh, lastly, how is the department addressing the issue of climate change and its impact on health needs and services. In particular, how is the department implementing sustainable practices in its work, including the development of new buildings and infrastructure? I'm asking this particular question because the NHI does not address the issue of developing already in, already existing mm-hmm. infrastructure and or building new hospitals and clinics. And this is an issue because with the NHI, people who are in township rural areas and former settlements will still be exposed to the current public health care systems because there aren't many private hospitals. And the, this is something that we need to address and have answers for, especially uh, in the public health care sector because our buildings, our equipment and issues, we raise these questions obviously through weekly uh, questions to the minister in particular, like raising a peculiar or particular instances where these issues need intervention. But on a national scale, what is the plan on, on, on fixing this particular issue? Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Chairperson, for, for the opportunity. Let me also welcome the presentation by, by the department. It was very informative. I hope that um, the department will be able to achieve all the set target as outlined in the APP. However, I've got uh, two or three questions to ask. The first question is, drawing from the experience of the pandemic, our healthcare system has had to endure and adapt to conditions of constraint, yet they were resilient, and so did our health workers and your leadership as the ministry. What lesson have you learned? Have you drawn from the experience to improve our public health care system to manage pandemics as we are in a period scientists have projected as a period of pandemics and disasters? The second question is, how is the department supporting the use of domestic health care products and innovation in the healthcare supply chain. Thirdly, how is the department supporting the Nelson Mandela Fidel Castro Medical Collaboration Program? And what is the extent of the impact of these important programs for health skills development in our nation? Lastly, what are the timelines of the various bills which the executive is also focusing on such as the control of marketing of alcohol beverage bill, the liquor amendment bill, the cannabis for private purpose bill, traditional health practitioners amendment bill, health ombud bill, and the office of the health standards compliance bill. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning. And- I want to join my colleagues in um, thanking the department for um, the for the presentation. I'm going to limit my questions um, to four questions. The um, first question I want to ask is around the quality improvement for hospitals. Um, this formed part of this pri- was a priority in uh, the previous financial year. And I would like to know what steps are taken to improve quality care at health facilities, um, given that the DOH has had this as a priority and focus um, in the last financial year, as I said, to improve quality care. So what steps have been taken? 
and um, and is there a measurement um, that the department has in order to um, see the steps that they've taken, whether there has been any improvement. Um, we are receiving, or I am at least in my constituency, receive um, on a monthly basis uh, um, complaints in terms of the quality of care that they receive at hospitals. Um, then secondly, um, could you provide an explanation for the indicator uh, to reduce the number of drug, drug susceptible TB deaths um, annual target um, to the committee? Thirdly, um, the health targets in line with the sustainable development goals um, in terms of the treatment of substance abuse, um, including narcotics, drug abuse, and harmful use of alcohol. If the department can provide us an outlay of what the DOH's plans are, and like my colleagues indicated with the questions that they've asked, whether there is an intersectoral plan to address these. Um, also, in terms of uh, uh, just to, to, to hang on to that same question or to hook up to that same question, what we are seeing is a is an increase in uh, medical uh, sorry in um, um, in mental health cases, and we know that the capacity of our um, hospitals and the capacity of our institutions are very low. What is being done um, to do to improve um, mental health care, especially at the primary care level? I know that in my um, district, for instance, where my uh, original constituency, we struggle to have a mental health a nurse for a period, uh, for a very long period, and people couldn't um, get those services. So what is being done um, to upscale training um, and capacity, especially, like I say, at the primary care level? Um, I think uh, Honourable Chirwa did, uh, you know, mention the termination of pregnancy. I want to make a comment. Um, in 2019, when I came in um, to, 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 to this term as an, as an MP, there was a case of a young doctor who provided um, counselling, full counselling to, um, to a woman seeking termination of pregnancy. That young doctor was penalized and he was never signed off and his medical career was stopped for the last five years because of his emphasis on giving full care to a patient. And it is an indictment that such a young doctor has been refused um, entry into the medical profession on the basis of his faith. So I want to make that comment because I highlighted it in the very first, I think, year of, of this uh, sixth parliament, how Dr. DeForce was discriminated against, and it is an indictment. So I want to add that um, comment there since the issue of termination of pregnancy was brought up. And also ask what is being done to ensure that women get full counseling when they seek termination. It's not only the termination of the pregnancy, but the wellness of the mother. How is the department making sure that the wellness of women in terms of pregnancy is ensured? Um, then lastly, in terms of the impact of HIV AIDS uh, programs and COVID-19, there is a need, especially, and if the department could comment if they are um, tracking the, the compliance and um, especially of teens living with HIV and AIDS, um, and especially in the school health program. How many young teens that are living with HIV and AIDS are um, staying with the treatment or falling off the treatment um, because of the fact that they um, are emotionally struggling um, with, um, you know, living with the reality of HIV AIDS as they are growing? And the reason I ask this is because of a particular case that happened in 2020, where a young, um, young teen living with HIV AIDS dropped off his treatment because of um, the, the manner in which um, he was treated 
when he visited the health facility. No um, confidentiality, having, um, you know, to face um, sitting in lines that is specifically for uh, people living with HIV and a, a, a total lack of se sensitivity. How is the department ensuring, in terms of their priorities, that you are focused specifically on um, the school health program and especially teenagers living with HIV and AIDS for them to, um, you know, overcome um, or, or sorry, to comply with um, with their treatment. I am thankful for seeing that the primary health care, that there is an increase that goes to 5.2 billion in terms of primary health care. If the department can give us um, an indication what they are doing to increase staffing capacity at this level, and what are they doing to address the morale of staff serving at this level? I've just indicated the issues um, that young people face if they live with a, um, a disease and they need to get treatment and you're being treated like, you know, um, without sensitivity. And a lot of it is to do with an, a, a staff that is overwhelmed. What is being done to address the morale of staff, to increase training and to improve quality services and operational standards at the at the health at the primary healthcare um, um, level because we get um, like I said a lot of um, complaints about how people are being treated at primary healthcare. Thank you, um, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you for the presentation from the Department of Health. As you can see, I've had to pull off on the highway to ask my questions, um, so please bear with me. Um, and through you, Chair, to the Minister and to the presenters. You know, it's very easy to put stuff on paper. It's very easy to set targets. Um, and it's going to say we're going to do this, this, and this, and we're going to meet this and this and this kind of targets. But until such time as we are prepared to get out of our chairs, put our techies on, and hit the tar, we are not dealing with the crisis in health in South Africa. And I want to give you a few examples. Let me start with the Livingston Hospital. It is a nightmare. The likes of Smith and & Nephew and several other major medical suppliers have refused categorically to do any more deliveries to the Livingston Hospital, and I'm not sure that the Livingston Hospital is the only one, because they have not been paid. And according to some of the people we've spoken to, they haven't been paid for six months. The surgery department, the theatres, the orthopedics have come to a standing halt. We have a little chap there who's four years old lying in that hospital. He was supposed to go into surgery four days ago, five days ago. They wouldn't feed him. They wouldn't give him anything to drink because he's going to theatre. He's going to theatre. He's going to theatre. Four days later, he still has not been in that theatre. They give him a little bit to drink and eat at night, but don't want to give him too much because he's going to theatre. How do we subject children and other patients to that kind of treatment in our hospitals? The DA called upon the, the Department of Health and the minister to declare, um, ad, to put the Eastern Cape under administration two years ago during the scooter debacle. Now we sit with an entirely different debacle. Honestly, Minister, somebody needs to do something about this. I recently did an oversight to the Philadelphia Hospital in Limpopo. What a shambles. Apart from the fact that that hospital is dealing with three provinces, it's supplying medical services to three provinces, there's no memorandum of agreement or funding coming from the two adjoining provinces. But that is the hospital with the highest number of stillborns um, cerebral palsy cases, medical ego claims, and it is not surprising. While I was there, I was in the maternity ward. There is no theatre for the maternity ward. While we were there, a woman was in such a state, she needed urgently a, um emergency Caesar. The theatres were full and busy. She lay for four hours waiting for an emergency seizure. Her uterus ruptured and the baby died. How is that? And, and you mentioned in the presentation, we want for South Africans a long and healthy life. Half the children there don't get to get lice. They don't get to get lice. Or they are mentally challenged for the rest of their lives due to cerebral palsy. What are we doing about that? Rob Ferreira Hospital is a nightmare. 
Their oncology department has got a backlog that you cannot even begin to describe. That hospital is literally sentencing people to death. Honestly, I'm going to let Satelli clinic on Monday morning. People there at that clinic are getting sicker and sicker. We have now established that the borehole that was put into that clinic by the Department of Health is so badly contaminated with sewage that the people who've been going to that, that clinic to get care who sit there in 37 degree heat drinking the water there are ended up being made sick by the Department of Health who are supposed to help them. Steve Biko Hospital. I don't even want to go to the cases that we are dealing with. Um, it's little wonder we have got medical claims. It is little wonder we've got medical claims. And when your medical claims start to way exceed your budget for medical legal claims, or in fact it doesn't, it way exceeds the department's budget full stop, then we must know that we've got a problem. And even if only 45% of those medical legal claims are paid out, the department's crippled. It's crippled. And you cannot bring lives back. We cannot be losing lives in the circumstances to, to minister and, and everybody else on this portfolio. No amount of money brings back lives. Um, I have asked for a report on the forensic chemical laboratories that we've taken over. The reports that we are getting from those facilities is, is, is shatteringly bad. There's been a huge amount of corruption. The facilities are disgusting. We've got labs in condemned buildings, so I have asked for that uh, for that report. We have had I raised that in the presentation. The other thing we're getting more and more and more of is sexual harassment cases. I referred one just last week to both you, the minister, and to the DG, to which I have not yet had uh, the grace of a reply or, or notification that my correspondence has already been received. Um, to the point where nurses and surgeons, women in the services who are being intimidated or harassed by doctors and consultants, um, to the point where they won't even fill in those ladies' logbooks. They're denying them the opportunity to write their final exams. I would like to know, please, from the department, how many sexual harassment cases they are aware of and what is being, being done about that. Um, one of the things we have a huge problem, uh, problem with, and, and we're seeing more and more of this, is medical waste. We need to seriously assess the tenders and where this medical waste is going to because we are now visiting sites where uh, medical waste is being dumped where it shouldn't be dumped, um, and that is just an horrendous situation. And just lastly, from my side, um, Chairperson and, and, and the delegation, it's interesting to see how much money has been put forward um, for NHI implementation. Um, and I find this fascinating, particularly because the NHI hasn't been passed yet. Um, we are nowhere near implementation stage, nowhere near. We still need to do a clause by clause um, discussion around that NHI and the constitutionality of some of those clauses. Um, it is nowhere near really going to go to parliament, let alone to president NCOP or anything else. Um, so I would really like to know what those funds that are, are that say they for NHI implementation are actually going to be used for because at this stage the NHI is not implemented and I don't think it's anywhere near getting there. Um, I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. Did I leave any member out? If not, uh, thank you for your raising your questions and your concerns with the minister and the department. Uh, well, I also have about four questions to, uh, to ask. Um, the one is on the infrastructure development projects. The second one is on compliance of provinces on, on certain uh, environmental health norms. And my third one, is on uh, the DOTS program and the loss of clients of so TB, TB and HIV uh, treatment. And the fourth one is on uh, COVID uh, vaccination of those between 12 and 34 years old. 
On my first question, Minister, we note that the infrastructure development projects and the maintenance plan implementation targets are part of the key diagnostics provided by the Presidential Health Summit. And that these projects are critical to healthcare service delivery. What can the department do to attract more funding for the public healthcare system as a contribution to the, con uh, to the infrastructure fund and which programs are receiving such support to mitigate the budget constraints of the department. On my second question, uh, on the compliance of the provinces on the level of uh, compliance on national uh, environmental health norms and standards, which is set at 75%, what is the level of compliance uh, of the nine provinces? And uh, on the question on TB and HIV treatment, what is the extent of the number of clients lost to follow up for TB and HIV treatment? And what are the causal factors of this? And how can the causal factors be addressed beyond community participation and beyond uh, the work of the community health workers? And what is the impact of the community health workers uh, are they having on this program? And then uh, what are the interventions in place to realize the target of 60% of young people between the ages of 12 to 34 years old uh, in terms of vaccination against COVID-19? And uh, yes, specifically, I note the low uptake by the youth. Now, I know we've had many questions uh, being asked by all of the members combined. We have one hour and 20 minutes left, uh, Minister. We look forward to those responses. Um, hopefully we can finish maybe at about five minutes to one for the latest so that I can also make some announcements. Thank you very much. Please proceed with those responses. Uh, thank you, uh, Thank you for uh, just estimating that we probably have upwards of 70, 70 something between 70 and 80 uh, questions. Uh, I've asked the uh, DG to start. Um, I know that uh, Deputy Minister is uh, uh, in case that and with the flood disaster areas, especially the health facilities. Uh, so if, if he's still on, he will also come in whenever it's possible. Uh, DG, uh, can we just start able to allocate? Uh, I know with uh, almost 80 questions, it might be and uh, very quick, I mean, very fast members were speaking very fast. I hope you were able to capture, I've, I've tried my best. And, and uh, if I can just invite you for, to start with um, those we have identified to start, and then I'll, I'll note where there are gaps and then I'll come in. DJ. Thank you very much, Minister, and uh, thank you, Chairperson and honorable members. Um, we have uh, a club uh, uh, questions uh, from different members into a number uh, into a number of ways, but I thought there's a few that I can just dispense off with. Um, uh, <clears throat> there, there is a question from a member that relates to a particular case of uh, sexual harassment and someone being refused uh, to write examinations with the registrar. Uh, we are actually working uh, with the relevant province on that case. Actually, that case has been uh, elevated to uh, uh, the, has been elevated to uh, the uh, president's presidency, and uh, there is a special task team that has been put together uh, that includes uh, the relevant law enforcement agencies, and we do have our one of our advocates from the department being involved in that case uh, just to follow it up.
Uh, I must say that um, uh, the department has a zero tolerance policy uh, on issues of uh, gender-based violence, uh, especially in the workplace. Uh, so uh, we are taking every reported case seriously and we ensure that uh, the relevant law enf uh, enforcement agencies are involved whilst we also activate our own um, uh, corrective measures uh, internally uh, in the department. So um, uh, we will uh, update once the, that uh, high level team that has been put together, led by the presidency, uh, has finalized their work. But I'm in constant contact also with the head of the department who has provided a full report uh, to that uh, presidential task team that is working uh, on that uh, particular case. And then the other, the second one that I would like to quickly uh, dispense uh, on uh, uh, honorable members, um, <clears throat> there is an issue that was raised by honorable Shengwa. Uh, on the issue, um, uh, on the issue of uh, um, uh, on, the, on the issue of the uh, 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 on, on the issue um, uh, uh, of uh, Saint Francis uh, Hospital, um, uh, which is uh, in uh, uh, in in Kolgeni. Uh, I must just take the members back that the issue of rationalisation of services um, uh, has been ongoing uh, in the province, actually in most provinces. As the members will even recall, if you look at Peter Maris back. Uh, some time back, there were three hospitals, which was Grace, North Day, uh, and Eating Day. Because it was not efficient to run all of them, running all full services, then there were designated district, uh, regional, uh, and, uh, and tertiary, so that there is no duplication of services. A similar exercise was done. Um, a similar exercise was done in uh, Newcastle uh, with Matadeni and uh, uh, with Matadeni and um, a, a Newcastle hospital, where a, a Newcastle uh, was dedicated as a mother and child hospital, uh, and then Matadeni dealt with all the other cases as a regional hospital. Similarly, uh, in King the trial, sim uh, the similar case was done uh, with uh, the two hospitals, the Queen Nandi and Welezane. And Queen Nandi was, was developed as a mother and child hospital, and then Gwilezane dealt with all the other general cases, and was also developed to a child hospital. So the similar issues being done with St. Francis and, and Congeni, because they are closer, to ensure that there is no duplication, but also there was a rationalization in terms of the management that probably because of the size of St. Francis Hospital, they needed to be a rationalization. They don't have to have a full set of management, uh, uh, but other issues can be looked after by Nkonji. Probably what might have been um, an issue that the province uh, has been advised to deal with is actually the communication with the stakeholders and ensure that the, even the health portfolio committee in the province is aware of what is happening. But we must assure the member that um, the hospital is not being closed and there is uh, there is no plan of closing the hospital. It's just the rationalization of services uh, in that area between the two hospitals as the other one is just across in Mashona, so they are close to each other. That is uh, that one. And then the third one that I would like to dispense with uh, uh, is uh, um, uh, is, the, is, is, the, is the issue of uh, from uh, Honorable Timbe uh, which is uh, the issue of uh, the, the impact of the, on, on, of the floods on Wazulu Natal. Uh, the Honorable Minister, accompanied by the Deputy Minister and the MEC, did a visit uh, to the province and we, uh, there was a good presentation. The main effect is that a number of facilities that are around 66 have been affected uh, 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 in terms of their infrastructure, the flooding, the leaks, uh, and, and others uh, because of their roads uh, that are leading to the hospitals. Um, and there has been a team, infrastructure team, led by our head of infrastructure, Mr. Mr. Takela, who will come in later, uh, and have done some initial assessments, and there's already work uh, being pushed. Uh, there, there has been a meeting with Treasury to try and see what uh, assistance can be put in. But the other area that the minister spoke of, which is very important, uh, is the issue of uh, the supply of water uh, into the facilities. A number of facilities have been affected, with Prism Shiani being one of those facilities, and they have been really been supplied by, supplied by the water tankers, uh, just to ensure that uh, work go, uh, continues. But we know that, obviously, if uh, water is cut, there's always some issues that uh, we need to be dealing with. Uh, it's not only the hospitals, uh, but we've asked 
through uh, the municipality and the, and the Department of Water and Sanitation that uh, we do get priority as the health facilities in terms of those facilities that need water uh, to be done. I think the third aspect that was impacted was uh, our forensic uh, services. Uh, it, they have had to deal with an increased number uh, of uh, autopsies. As we all know that by law, any unnatural death uh, will need to have an autopsy or a post-mortem done. But we must uh, applaud the province uh, and the department that uh, we've been able to clear the backlogs um, and we had to bring in extra capacity in terms of private uh, pathologies uh, to clear those post-mortems. There is ongoing work, of course, that with the displaced people uh, that have been put in schools and in, uh, in some of uh, the, the halls that we did visit with the minister, we are providing uh, outreach services in terms of health services in that area to ensure that uh, they, we don't uh, lose them. That's part of the work that the deputy minister is involved in in Wazulu Natal as we speak. And then the last one, of course, that we need to be uh, forward thinking on, uh, forward thinking uh, on uh, is the issue of um, uh, the forward thinking that need to have a forward thinking on uh, is the issue uh, uh, of um, uh, the possible outbreak of enteric diseases. Uh, which is common after the floods. That's your cholera, uh, your, 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 your salmonella, uh, typhi or typhoid fever, uh, and also looking uh, at all the other E. e, e coli related diseases, uh, shigella and all those uh, uh, diseases. So obviously what's more important there is the issue of the water. Uh, uh, how do we ensure that water is purified uh, since there is a problem with the supply of water? So our teams of environmental health are working closely with the municipalities and water and sanitation to ensure that we prevent uh, the outbreak of those diseases. So that is uh, that. Those are the few that I want to take. But uh, with uh, the, your uh, indulgence, uh, uh, Honourable Chair, I would request as follows: that uh, there is a number of questions that relate to NHI pharmaceutical services and uh, the NHI grant and all the issues uh, that have come up, including the vaccination. Dr. Nicholas Crisp is going to be the first one and he will deal with all those issues that relate to that. Then uh, the second one will be the issues that relate to medical legal claims. And there's quite a number of questions that came uh, on that area. And I will ask uh, Ms. Valerie Rennie, she's going to be dealing uh, with those questions. And then there's a group of questions that relate to HIV, to TB, uh, uh, maternal and child health, uh, which includes uh, issues of maternal mortality. There's the CGA report. Uh, Dr. Zuki Pinini will deal uh, uh, with those questions. And then questions that are related mainly to primary health care, health promotion, environmental health, and, and other uh, 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 related issues will be dealt with uh, by Mr. Morewane. And then uh, where he will then be followed by uh, 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 the issues that relate to infrastructure, also, uh, uh, in terms of all the infrastructure related matters that will be dealt with, with Mr. Uh, by Mr. Takela, who's our head of uh, infrastructure and facilities management. Then there were issues around nurse training, uh, shortage of nurses, uh, and uh, uh, the number of nurses have been trained, where are they, where they come from. Uh, Ms. Pakiso. Uh, Namatsi Banani is going to deal um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with those questions. Then there is a specific question that talks about procurement uh, on how we look at uh, local uh, 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 products uh, into the supply chain system. And I will request that uh, that, would, that is dealt with by Ms. Dikereti Chavalala, who is head of our supply chain. That, is, uh, that, that would be the order of uh, the questions. Uh, and I will then request that uh, Dr. Nicholas Crisp start and we follow that order. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, DG. Good morning to the Honourable Chair and members of uh, the committee, as well as to the Minister, Deputy Minister, colleagues and members of the media. So I hope I don't miss out. I was noting what the DGs asked me to respond to. I'll start with the Honourable Ismail's questions about national health insurance and what we've learned from COVID that we would take forward. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of lessons. The first one is that we are one nation. We are not nine different provinces and the public and the private sector need to work together. And we've shown that not only can we, but we can extremely effectively. And the levels of cooperation between the public providers and the private providers during this time has been exemplary. And we, I would like to uh, thank everybody who's been involved in that process. 
What we've also learned is that the digital systems to manage the health system must be integrated. And during this time, the EVDS, the stock visibility system, and the DATCOV uh, reporting system for admissions and uh, management of cases has all been one single coherent system that the public and the private sector players all participate in. Without that, we would never have been able to plan, and it has been possible for all participants to see the same dashboards at a very uh, refined level of detail. So that's been a very important uh, um, learning during this time. Uh, there have been others around how to handle a large volumes of vaccines in a short space of time. We've also had to handle very much colder vaccines than we've ever handled before. And learning those logistics pathways and how to procure and distribute during this time has been very important. We've also learned the resilience of our chronic medicines distribution system, notwithstanding the lockdown and the constraints. And it's something for us to strengthen, and I'll deal with that a bit later because there was another question about it from another honorable member. So there have been many lessons, but I won't uh, go into any more of them. As far as the medical aid beneficiaries on the HPRS is concerned, um, there's a legal challenge to the way in which it was intended, and there, that would require an amendment to the legislation, which will have to come back to the House for honorable members to debate. But in the meantime, what we do have is the private sector have established a health information exchange, which is linked to the public sector uh, health information exchange, and we're working on making that a smoother transfer. And what that means is that we all know which people uh, in the country are on medical aids on a given day, never mind on an, a weekly or a, a monthly basis. So there's a lot of work to do to make that flow smoothly, and it has been extremely effective so far in the re in the reimbursement of the vaccination program. So again, another success of collaborating and working closely together. The question was asked about uh, wanting to see the organogram and 75% of the staff filled. The organogram is under still under development. It is with the, the discussion between the Department of Public Service and the National Health Department. The acting CFO showed a figure of 41 million rand that has been set aside to establish a number of posts for critical skills in the space. And that will all happen now in the, in the next couple of months. As I said, it's not entirely within the health department's, uh, only in the health department's domain. It's between ourselves, the National Treasury and DPSA, but we're happy with the progress we are making and with the collaboration with the department's concern. As soon as that is finalized, I'm sure we will, def we will share it with, uh, with the honorable members of the committee. Um, so there was a question asked also by Honorable Ismail about the HPRS and how did we achieve the 57 million people who are on the system. There's very close cooperation. First of all, people come to health facilities and they get registered at the health facilities. This has been going on for several years already. So a lot of people come to the facilities on a daily basis and register themselves. There are also databases that we use in our HIV, TB, immunization and other programs where we can cross-correlate and triangulate the memberships as we load them. But we have a very close working relationship with the Department of Home Affairs, who's primarily responsible for the registration of people. So cleaning up those databases together has made it possible, uh, and also the Department of Social Development, where we uh, both look after people with disabilities and many of the elderly. So there's quite a lot of correlation and triangulation of these databases. Is it puppy compliant? Yes, it's puppy compliant. We're very strict on this, and the Auditor General monitors what we do and engages with us while we are busy with the system. In other words, not retrospectively, but while we are busy making the changes on the system, and their digital teams are working closely with us to check that whatever we're doing is properly documented and compliant. It's not just the FOPIA legislation. There's other legislation we must comply with as well. Regarding the spending on the NHI grant, there was also a question asked on this by, um, uh, by Honorable Wilson. So maybe I'll just uh, talk about it. The bulk of what has been spent and approved by the House, by, the, by Parliament over the last four or five years, that is labeled as NHI conditional grant, is health system strengthening to prepare for the, the um, improvements that are required for the national health insurance. 
So if one goes into those conditional grants, this year's budget, it starts on page 153 of the document, and there are, is a substantial list with very detailed descriptions of the conditions on these grants, and those were adopted. That is tabled by the Minister of Finance, and it is adopted by Parliament. So uh, perhaps what would be useful is if we have an engagement session where we go through them one at a time, so that we can elucidate in greater detail what is system strengthening. There are components of it. Part of it is the strengthening of the primary healthcare environment. Part of it is specifically on mental health in the community. There's also a section dealing with oncology services and so forth, uh, HIV, AIDS, TB. It is all under the auspices of strengthening the health system and improving services for national health insurance. And all that it means is that this money is not going through the provincial equitable shares, but it's going through designated funding, either directly to the provinces or through an indirect grant spent by the national department. It's quite complicated, so I'm not surprised that it's quite hard to check and trace what's going on. Even for us, sometimes uh, we, we really got to keep a, a mind on what, is, what we are following. I'll go to uh, Honorable Ismail's question on vaccine development very briefly. So vaccine development is something that we are engaged with the Department of Science and Innovation. They are the primary lead on this, and there are a number of vaccine development programs going on. There have been quite a lot in the media lately because of COVID, but it's not only COVID vaccines we are interested in. The big uh, and very well-known prominent um, projects are Afrigen, which is a partnership program based in Cape Town, of which the state participates as long, along with universities and other uh, bodies. Then there's the um, BioVac, which is a partly owned state company uh, where the Department of Science and Innovation holds shares in that company. They're a very important partner of ours in COVID, but they're also a very important partner in the delivery of other vaccines for us. And they are busy with vaccine development and a refrigeration freezer farm, as they call it. Then there's the NANT SA, which is a, a, um, an American-based uh, company with a South African-born philanthropist who is investing in vaccine development in South Africa. And the fourth one is the Tabeja plant of Aspen, which started off with fill and finishing of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine now for COVID, but is now moving into the capabilities and licensing arrangements to do further vaccine work in the country. So there's a lot going on this org as well, not just for South Africa, but for SADC and the rest of Africa. Uh, we are partners with the uh, various uh, bodies, including the African and international through COVAX and so forth. So there's quite a lot happening in that space. Uh, Honorable Geller asked about health worker capacity and when will the uh, public health system be ready for national health insurance? So... The, the answer to the question is very long and complicated, and we have debated it a bit when we responded to the questions around the National Health Insurance Bill. The point of the, it is that it's a long and ongoing process. So the, uh, the health resources are distributed inequitably across the country, and the process of getting that equity requires a different financing formula and a different service delivery platform. And that is what the NHI Bill is trying to achieve. So in terms of getting ready, that is why we are spending money on the very many components of what's called the NHI grant, including the human resources components of that grant. But on its own, that will not, in a short space of time, solve all the challenges that we have. So we, there are improvements in some, human, uh, in, um, some of the capacity in provinces. But as we know, uh, many questions were asked about human resources. If you don't have the budget, you can't employ the people even with the best will in the world and even though we would like to. Honorable Munyai asked about um, uh, the development in South Africa of um, pharmaceutical products and specifically about Ketlapela. So there's a big program running in the country, uh, mostly um, through the Department of Trade and Industry, who's spearheading the development of a plan for the development of the pharmaceutical and other health products in the country. Um, a lot of private companies are taking part and a, a number of government departments, obviously ourselves included, identifying where the strengths and weaknesses are and where the opportunities are to manufacture products in South Africa. Some of that is pharmaceutical and Ketapella is one of those. 
And Caterpillar um, model is as a state company is something we are still engaging with them. They have made representations to the department, but it's far more complicated than meets the eye. And often with these types of new developments and new companies, the kind of capital that's required and the impact that it makes on other companies has to be considered at the same time. So it's not necessarily just a bilateral debate and it's not as straightforward. So uh, that is uh, an, an ongoing discussion. Um, and then there was a question around uh, from Honorable Clark. I'll deal with the question around slide nine, where the targets that are referred to, Honorable Clark mentioned the 6.5 million registered people and asked what happens to the unregistered people? Are they denied service? So maybe just to clarify, this is the people who are registered on the chronic medicine delivery system. So if you don't have a chronic disease, you will, and I hope you don't, you will never get onto the chronic medicines delivery system because you don't need to get a routine script delivered to your home or to your pharmacy or to a drop-off point down the road from your home. So what we are targeting is to have more than 10% of the entire South African population having access to medicines delivered in this way. That may or may not be equivalent to the number of people who are on chronic medicines but it is the start. So those who do not have uh, chronic medicines but need to get medicines from time to time will collect them through the, the normal delivery mechanisms at pharmacies and at uh, hospitals, clinics, and so forth. This is specifically for the chronic medicine uh, program, which, by the way, the department and the team who works on it won an, an innovation award for this program this year. We're very proud of it. Um, the NHI funding, the 1.5 billion allocated this year, I think I have uh, covered. It's about health system strengthening, and there are very specific things we are trying to strengthen, particularly the purchasing of uh, private provider care in, in specific communities. So it's, a, it's really to make sure that the bridging between the public and the private sector happens smoothly, and that includes... Um, uh, programs that are lagging behind, like mental health and oncology. But um, uh, we can go into details if, if we need to do that later. Um, so just to remind us that these monies are allocated by the finance department, by Treasury, and they are uh, signed off already because the budget has already been uh, presented. Our health budget will still be presented, of course, when the House will get an opportunity to comment on the specifics. But uh, these monies are allocated in collaboration with our colleagues in Treasury, and there may not be money for some things, but there are certainly money for the improvement of these, uh, these services, which we're very grateful for. Um, Honorable um, Wilson also asked uh, about, uh, Clark, sorry, also asked about uh, vaccination targets, and there was also a question from the chair, um, Honorable Jacobs, about what is happening, vaccination targets, and what is happening and the increases of COVID in the past week. So we had set these vaccination targets at the time of dra drafting the APP, which is, was before Christmas. And uh, obviously, we are now going to be stretched to reach these targets because vaccination uptake has decreased. The public has got uh, prematurely confident about uh, COVID, we believe, and is no longer so enthusiastic about coming for vaccination. Uh, so we will struggle to increase uh, to get to the targets that ha we have set ourselves. Uh, however, we do know that COVID has not gone. We, we watch very closely on a day-to-day -day basis. The data is all in the public domain and it's updated every day on the SA Coronavirus website via the department, both the vaccination and the cases. And we obviously in the department are watching it at a minute level of detail. So there is some increase at the moment, and we are aware of, obviously, where it is and the, the, the trends that are showing. We also do know that some weeks ago, uh, other parts of the world were reporting some sub-variants of uh, this Omicron coronavirus variant. We also have some sub-variants of which the BA4 and BA5 are relatively dominant at the moment in our landscape and may or may not be rising these flames. So we will watch carefully over the next few days to see whether this is a real trend or if it's just a, a small flicker of a flame 
uh, for now. Uh, but as we know the information and it becomes clearer, we will know what to do, and the minister will make appropriate announcements if and when uh, that is required. We did not return grant money. Uh, there, as the CFO, acting CFO reported, in fact, because of COVID last year, we were obliged to shift some of our NHI strengthening uh, grant money into fighting COVID uh, because of the pressures that we were experiencing at the time. Uh, the Honorable Tembukwaya also asked about long-term investment of vaccines, but I've dealt with that. Uh, dealing with the next wave of variants, well, we so far it looks like everything, the vaccines we are using, the two vaccines that we have in abundance in the country, work extremely effectively. And the important thing for all of us, including the public, to note is that uh, boosting with vaccines, both the Johnson & Johnson and the Pfizer vaccine, which we use, uh, creates a cellular immunity, which is a longer-lasting immunity than the antibody response that we get from just wild virus exposure. So if you want to protect yourself, the best way to do it is to get several doses of vaccine as we are providing in the vaccination program. Uh, Honorable Harvard asked about the program on digital transformation. This is a major part of our investment and uh, has been for some years. That is why we were able to get the EVDS and the stock visibility system running so quickly. We are busy with integrating the smaller computer programs that deal with specific diseases into the mainstream of the total digital system. And I've already referred to the uh, information exchange. Uh, both in the private sector and our own information exchange. So digital transformation is a massive part of what we are doing at the moment, and we still aspire to have a single patient record using the health patient registration system with the generated number as the single patient record that everybody will have access to in the country going down the line. That's the, w the way to go, but it, it does take time, and um, it takes connectivity as well. And that's something we're working on with the other government departments who, are, who work in that space. Uh, nearing the end of my questions, Honorable Wilson uh, also asked about money for NHI. Uh, so I think, I, uh, Honorable Wilson, I hope I've dealt with an answer to your question. Um, and so the last part of the question from the chairperson, Honorable Jacobs, was how are we going to reach the 12 to 34-year-olds? So they are two different groups. The 12 to 17-year-old population may, you, may be vaccinated with only Pfizer vaccine. We can't use Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It's not registered for use in minors, whereas the Pfizer vaccine is. Um, reaching this population at the moment is a, perhaps a bit of a luxury, but there are quite a large number of adolescents in this age group who are at risk should they get COVID. So I guess that they are the ones who are coming forward first. And people of this age group who congregate, you know, work socially and go to school are at risk. And the families and environments that they live in do continue to put them at risk. So we will encourage uh, adolescents to come forward for vaccination. But the group between the ages of 18 and 34 are the, the biggest population uh, group that we deal with in the country. And um, there's inter our social listing reports have told us that this group seems to believe as a, as a group that uh, COVID will not affect them badly. And if they do get infected, it will be mild. Well, the history has shown us that that may well be the case in general. But for those, that proportion of the population who do get sick, they get really sick. And people of this age group do die. And... Um, especially if they have uh, other complications and have been immunocompromised for any reason. They become extremely vulnerable. So this population, the challenge is also that they are the working force. So if they do get sick, even if mildly sick and need to stay at home, there's a negative impact on their families. And because we all live within families and family groups, the chance of infecting other people who might be older and at greater risk is increased. So um, we do try and convey this information on a regular basis as part of our uh, programs, uh, and we will continue to provide the information so that everyone can see. And the vaccines, we are constantly looking for 
new ways to improve sites and improve delivery. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, DJ. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Chris. Uh, uh, Valerie? Thank you, TG. Honorable members, the minister, deputy minister. So my response will be related to the medical legal uh, issues. Um, largely, the first and the bills. So uh, the first one, let me just switch off the video. So the first response relates to the four bills, and, uh, and we got a question uh, from the honorable member related to, firstly, the control of, of marketing of alcohol beverages uh, bill and the liquor amendment bill, as well as the uh, cannabis for private purpose bills. Those three bills, the, the national department is not leading on those they are led by other departments, specifically the Department of uh, Agriculture and the Department of Justice. They, are, they will be in a better position to indicate how far the bills are. The bills that we are managing as national health are the, the um, traditional health practitioners uh, amendment bill, the health ombud bill, and the Office of Health uh, Standards uh, Compliance bills. Those are in the current legislative uh, program for the current financial year 2022 and 2023. And uh, some of them we intend uh, approaching cabinet with uh, by the end of June. And we, we are on track in terms of ensuring that these three bills reach parliament during the current uh, program or the financial year. So the question related to the case management system and why Western Cape is not participating is, uh, Purely because when we started the transversal uh, tender, and by that we mean that it is for the Department of Health with the participation of the provinces, the Western Cape uh, Department participated in the process towards the uh, um, advertising of the tender. But at the time of implementation, all provinces had to indicate whether they will participate in the tender or not, and uh, Western Cape indicated that the systems that they have in place in Western Cape are functional and they don't need any review or any upgrade. Therefore, they will continue with their system while we, we, we implemented the case management system for the eight provinces. However, as and when we require information for consolidation, they submit their data and we have a consolidated uh, a picture for the entire uh, country for the nine provinces. Then the issue related to the why only we are targeting four provinces, yet the previous year was seven. I'm sorry, yes, seven out of the eight. The fact is that for the previous financial year, we have already achieved rolling out the case management system to four provinces, I'll name them, KZN, Northern Cape, Free State, and Northwest. So the target for this APP is for the remaining four provinces, which are Eastern Cape, Cape uh, sorry, Eastern Cape, Gauteng, Pumalanga, and Limpopo. Hence the, uh, the, the target saying only four. It is four of the eight because the four has already been uh, uh, dealt with in the previous year. They are implementing the case management system as we speak. The question related to the, East, uh, the Eastern Cape, medical legal uh, uh, challenges, and what is the national department doing with that uh, uh, to assist or to intervene? The Eastern Cape is participating in the intervention that the national department has put in place, and that includes the legal side where the national department is working with the Department of Justice, and um, members might be aware that the Department of uh, Justice is busy with the state liability amendment bill, which was presented in parliament in 2018, as well as last year, January last year. And the Portfolio Committee of Justice indicated that they don't want to deal with that state amendment bill in piecemeal. So they are waiting for the Department of Justice to deal with the issue of the uh, South African law reform uh, process uh, in terms of the uh, reform, the legal reform of all the uh, uh, relevant bills. 
And uh, maybe members might be also aware that the Department of Justice uh, published the discussion paper in January this year uh, related to that uh, legislative reform related to the litigations and the, that uh, and the Department of Health is one of the key stakeholders that will benefit from that legislation. Largely, that legislation will assist the department and the provinces to look at the future medical expenses. And we hope that once that can be approved, which uh, takes 80% of actually the court orders for, for the uh, 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 cases that are presented before court, it will save the, the, the budgets of the provinces and they'll be able to focus on the intended uh, service delivery purposes because we, we hope that the approval uh, uh, will be that we pay future medical cost uh, expenses uh, by utilizing our facilities where we have capacity instead of paying uh, lump sums. And that is uh, some of the interventions that we are assisting Western, I mean, Eastern Cape and the rest of the other provinces as national health, including the uh, 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 fraud and investigation uh, part of this intervention where um, the bogus uh, 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 practices by some attorneys is under uh, uh, investigation. And those cases will be shared with the SIU at the right time, as soon as the uh, president has proclaimed the, the, the act for the uh, investigation by SIU. So those are the responses uh, uh, related to medical legal. Uh, the last uh, DG, the last question that I wanted to address relates to the um, insourcing, whether we are insourcing uh, or outsourcing uh, cleaners, uh, service cleaning services and security. The department has taken a, a policy decision as National Health Council that we will work on the insourcing and work was done to audit specifically the security services. Unfortunately, the uh, insourcing cost estimates came out to be unaffordable for most provinces. So provinces are implementing that, including national, in a phased-in approach based on availability of funds, because we are not able to uh, 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 hire new uh, security officers or cleaners in the current limited uh, cost uh, uh, or funding that is available for compensation of employees, especially because we are working within the ceilings that are, are put in place by Treasury. So the bulk of the expenditure is within professional services and hence for most provinces are still having a hybrid model where they have both insourced as, as well as outsourced uh, services. Thank you, DJ. I'll stop that. Stop there. Thank you, honorable members and minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary. Uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Zogi Swapinini to deal with the questions? In the interest of time, uh, I will look for Dr. Ben. May I ask Mr. Reverend Morewane to come in on primary health care and related questions? Mr. Morewane? Uh, good afternoon, DG, and good afternoon, honorable members. I, I must say I have got a terrible network. I hope I can be, I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes. did you yes. and, yeah. On Honorable Chair and, and members, I have noted a, a number of questions that were raised. I'll deal with the first one, and I'll just deal with them because some of them are overlapping. So I'll deal with them as I've captured them. Some of them are captured them programmatically. Uh, there was a question about the mental health policy framework that in the APP, uh, particularly for 2021-2022, it is written not applicable. It, it, is, it is, that reading is correct, honorable member, because we are saying in 2021-2022, we didn't have any activity in that, in that space. But because we have written it this year, we then do not want to create an impression as if there was some work done in 2021-2022. That is why we read it not applicable. And if it can be seen, by the columns uh, preceding that, it would be written as a new indicator, a new indicator. But indeed, from 2020 to 2023, 
were proceeding with the policy development and the succeeding years going to the outer years will show progress that will be made and how it will be monitored uh, to, to, uh, throughout the, 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 the lifespan of, uh, of, our, of our activities in the department. There, there, were, there were other questions uh, that were raised, and I just want to deal with them quickly around mental health. We, 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 we firstly acknowledge that it was a weak, there's a weakness in the mental health services. And the following are the, uh, the, the, the activities that were undertaken and are in place, and others are in the process of being put in place. We've, we've put in place the mental health care review boards in all provinces. So there's no province that does not have a mental health care review board. So those boards are very helpful because they then work with the health service providers on the ground to ensure one, access of services, two, that is service of good quality, three, just to make sure that mental health care users are protected against any abuse or any untoward uh, uh, events or any adverse events. The minister has appointed a ministerial advisory committee. The advisory committee is in place. Uh, in fact, it, it, it helps because it's made up of experts. These experts come from non-governmental organizations, civil society, academia, practicing clinicians, and they are the ones that are outside of the influence of officials. They are independent in their own right, and therefore they are able to make sure that they monitor the delivery of mental health services. Whether, whether, whether we are involving other stakeholders, I would say truly, yes, we do. We have in place an intersectoral committee on mental health, and this is made up of government department, Department of Social Development, Department of Education, both lower and higher education, civil society organization. And this is because the Human Rights Commission had, had actually identified this gap, and once they identified that gap, we then went on as an implementation of the recommendations of the South African Human Rights Commission to establish this intersectoral committee. There are in place plans, and, and they've been running very quickly, to integrate mental health care into the primary health care services. And we have done that through training, through skills development, to ensure that the health professionals are skilled, are able to proactively detect, support, and refer people with mental health disorders when they are required to to be transferred. And in the in the, case, in the annual report is, uh, that, that of the year that passed, we've reported that we've conducted training of medical doctors and professional nurses working in designated medical or psychiatric units at a district and regional hospitals and, and, and all other facilities that are listed to be providing 72 hour services. So, so I'm, I'm just taking long on this one because it came up several times, but I just want to say in conclusion, Regarding the substance abuse, we've got the what we call a health sector drug master plan. And with a health sector drug master plan, we have taken on board all rule players, but we wanted to bring it closer to hell so that it is hell that drives them, that drives the plan, rather than depending on other stakeholders. So they are then invited at our call to come and participate. Regarding the cancer campaign, cancer support, and oncology services. You see, cancer support, it you know, goes on from the beginning, from the lowest level of the end of the health system, through health education and, and health promotion, because we'd want to empower people to make sure that they are able to identify the signs of cancer in the earlier stages. You know, we want to teach mothers on how to detect breast cancer, for an example. We're encouraging mothers to come up for pap smears in the primary health care facilities. In fact, we, 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 we do pap smears in all primary health care facilities. So, so therefore, that is one way of making sure that the detection is made much earlier. But we are also having the department is actually put aside a good amount of money to support oncology services. I think making reference to other separate in Gauten and to use it to describe a, a, the attitude of the department and its actions regarding cancer it would not become a fair way to do an approach because we're dealing with a unique situation and we're able to point where the weakness has been. But to want to then assume that that is the case throughout the world, then throughout the country, it will not become a very good representation, unfortunately. But what I'm presenting is what we're doing across the board. And with regard to a primary health care, let me deal with it broadly in this central approach. That uh, primary health care has been poised to, to deliver 
good quality services. I mean, we we, we decided the, as far back to want to have quality improvement initiatives. One such, it's an ideal clinic. And, and, and ideal clinic has shown throughout the countries to have reached out to a total of 3,470 clinics plus. And we reach out to them through baseline status determination every year to know what is wrong in each area. So it's one of the major quality improvement initiatives that we've taken. And we're very grateful that uh, we have this budget from National Treasury that we are using to build and strengthen the system for delivery of services at that level. And that funding also goes into supporting community outreach services, which is where we employ community health care workers, which is where we're working with them, which is where we, we're giving them uh, uh, extra support, including uh, outreach team leaders. So we're using that plan to strengthen malaria control uh, and malaria management. Because we don't want to eliminate mal malaria in the country. We don't want to run and register at least two this sub district a sub district where there's no there's zero malaria transmission for a year under review so would want to use that money to build that capacity but is primary health care being supported with, with with hr yes it is i mean there's always been bias towards employment of primary health care of human resources at primary health care level i'm not about to say there are no vacancies and i'm not about to say People that are sent there as communities when they complete, they want to leave. But there's always been a determination to allocate nurses to that level. And, and, and this has been shown. And if I want to give an example, even at the height of COVID-19, nurses at primary health care level continue to deliver services, continue to do ideal clinic work, continue to make sure that clinics are performing at the highest level. And for me, I've never seen any level where resources have been deployed where people they were determined to do it, as I've seen in primary health care. Uh, with regard to uh, the messaging on TikTok or YouTube, we, 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 we are aware that the social media evolves and evolves even much faster. So what we'll do, working together with the communication colleagues, we, we will capture every moment to build on any imaging and re-imaging media platforms that we would use. And it has been proven that the TikToks are very important because they are now in town. They are now fashionable, but tomorrow it may be something else. So our team is very agile, very alert to ensure that every other opportunity that arises, we are able to to to, to reach to so that we can then reach out as many people as possible. And particularly the others that are using this gadget. Uh, what, what what are we doing? We're standing in the countryside, you know, working. I mean, to, uh, by, to through side by side by side messaging. Well, what do we do? We we have. A nutrition strategy, and, and we're going ahead with health promotion and school education program. We want to teach mothers, one, as mothers that are pregnant, two, as mothers that are breastfeeding, but as mothers that are bringing children up, so that they must be able to take their children for growth monitoring. They must be able to take their children to the facilities. We administer vitamin A in the clinics and all forms of vaccination and immunization programs for children are available in our primary health care facilities. But we want to make sure that our children grow and therefore they do not get stunted in, 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 in the progression towards growth. In terms of, uh, uh, the, there was a question on the plan to increase, well, what are we doing uh, with regard to the increased number of COVID-19 cases? Uh, I, I must say we, we, are, we are ready for any resurgence because we have demonstrated in the past five sessions of resurgence or five to four waves that uh, we have been able to respond. We are in communication with all stakeholders. In fact, what we have done, we have asked provinces to do four major things now. We said, now we know what we're doing. We want provinces to do full review of the four waves. Secondly, we want the provinces to then do what you call planning back better. What are we doing? We want to make sure that they plan back better to ensure that they do the fourth thing, which is to continue delivering the healthcare services, but also number four, to continue uh, uh, resetting and recover the health system. So about the losses that were that we suffered as a result of COVID-19 are gained. And we don't want to then come back after COVID is over, realize that everything has been lost. So even as we cast our eyes ahead facing the storm, we remember on the hindsight that there are issues that we need to continue to do. So this is what we're doing as we're approaching the, the, the possible resurgence. 
uh, regarding Monon Pilo, uh, I must say that uh, I think we, community, community outreach services is going to help us to strengthen the work that's been done here. I think there's a work that's going on and it's led by Dr. Crisp in terms of uh, how, how we're going to get ministerial determination to make sure that these people have paid their salaries. They met us before the bargaining council. And I'm sure when I was disconnected, this may have been covered. But I must say that we're working together in the department to ensure that this cadre of uh, contributors to improvement of health services are not left in the ledge without being supported. With regard to climate change, South Africa, the National Department of Health, is the first department after environmental affairs to come up with a national climate adaptation plan, climate change adaptation plan. We are now revising that plan. We're working together with academia, with our South African Medical Research Council and, and, and Human Science Research Council. So we should be able to produce a revised plan before the end of the year. And we're doing that quite determinedly to make sure that we are adaptive to the impact of, of, of climate change. Of course, the other areas, I'm sure in terms of the buildings, the infrastructure colleague will be able to deal with that. The environmental health norms and standards, Honorable Chair, what, what we're doing in the country today, we, we want to make sure that all municipalities are rendering environmental health services that are compliant with the norms and standards. So what we then do, we look at 52 municipalities through the same lens that the municipalities are looked at. So we find that their readiness and capacity is impacted upon by all other areas that are afflicting the municipalities. But to date, we have reported 24 municipal district municipalities out of 52 that have performed over 75% regarding the norms and standards. And we've got a plan in place to make sure that we then target those that have fallen below. I'm dead sure that we'll be able to come up closer to a desirable number, maybe of about eight to so, because as I'm saying, for them to be able to render, implement the norms and standards, they need to be at a standard where even service delivery generally is up to par. So, Honorable Chair and 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 and, and the Minister and, and 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 the members of the committee, members of the media, the DG, and all the colleagues in the department, this is where my responses will end. Thank you very much, and over to. Good afternoon, uh, Honorable Minister and members. I will switch off the camera because I don't have enough uh, power. I'll respond to the HIV and TB programs and also the maternal child and, and women's health. The question on in relation to the target on program three to find and treat people with TB disease over 200,000. Uh, the response is that uh, we have had a TB prevalence survey that suggested that we have um, about 390,000 of new infections of TB annually. So we've been finding about 200,000 of these patients. That is why we're having a, a gap of finding the 150,000 patients on TB every year. And the next question was on what is the extent of the number of clients lost to follow up for TB and HIV treatment? And what are the causal factors of this and how, how can the causal factors be addressed? The response is that the loss to follow up can be caused by many factors, including the long duration of the treatment, especially for the multi-drug resistant TB, the high pill burden, and also seeing about some of our patients not coming back for checkups. There's also a factor that the TB patients are co-infected with HIV, so they'll be taking both treatment for TB and HIV, and they could, that could affect their compliance. There are factors that they also need some nutritional support, they need to be supported at home, et cetera. And it could be that loss follow-up can be attributed to the mobile nature of our patients, the mobility of patients that they are here tomorrow, the other day they are somewhere. And also there are patients who might be coming outside the borders of South Africa. And some of the patients, they just decide to stop, to just disengage with the services. With community care workers, they do go and trace patients in the facilities. We also have a campaign within our health facilities that is welcoming back campaigns. It's, it's aiming at, at finding out all those patients who have just been lost to fill up, fill up for whatever reasons, such that when they come to our facilities, the facility managers and the facility uh, staff will know how to deal with them in a friendly manner. Um, the other question was about the HIV program affected by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. 
yes, uh, the programs have been affected by the pandemic, but we managed to we managed to give our patients treatment through the chronic medicines. This is MDD program, and also when the patients were we had help from our partners where we did the medication was delivered to the patients home during that time. But after that, we have our catch up plans where, where we're looking, where, where we are looking at strategies of how to retain patients and to find them. And currently, our performance it has shown that we are coming back to where we were, almost where we were before the pandemic. And the other question was about TB and HIV treatment in schools. We do have an integrated school health program uh, with, with, with the Department of Education, but as a Department of Health, we just bring services closer to the schools. We do not go into the school. The Department of Basic Education has amalgamated an integrated HIV and TB and STI policy, but they are still working with the school governing bodies. But because there was COVID in that process is still on. So what happens when the nurses find something with the school child having a problem that needs clinical care, they will refer the person next to the to a clinic that is nearest to their home for treatment. The other question was about um, uh, the, the, the youth adolescents that are infected by HIV and are having treatment and have to default because of the, of the attitude or the insensitivity way that they're treated. To say that uh, as a Department of Health, we are, we are implementing the youth-friendly services in our facilities. This is to increase access of services, health services to the youth and adolescents that are coming to our services. This is where the youth, they meet and they are treated by a, a, a person, a healthcare worker who understands the youth issues. So in a way, they are encouraging, encouraging them to be on treatment if they want to take treatment, if they are on treatment or ART, and they also support them on that treatment. And to give them also information on the SRH and also uh, the determination of pregnancy, if they may be in need of that. We also do go to a, a TBS and universities to give them information about that. Regarding the, the adolescents that are not uh, compliant with medical with treatment, we do have a, a support support uh, partners that are looking at some of these uh, strategies and how to retain adolescents within the health services. And the next one was about the from honorable knowledge regarding the obstetric services. To say that for now, um, Within the health uh, healthcare system, we are receiving reports from the Eastern Cape, where the honourable uh, member notified us that there were no services. In February, we have received about 1,064 uh, terminations that were conducted in the Eastern Cape. So it means that there are services available. It could be that in this in the facility where that person went to, there were no services to whatever reasons. And in response to the are saying that you are saying, yes, Honorable. Chairperson, through your point of order, please. Honorable Chirwa, point of order. Thank you. You may raise it. Thank you so much. I just wanted to give clarity to, to the NDOH. This is not a case basis thing. We got this report from the AG that there's three provinces in the country that don't offer um, termination of, of, of pregnancies. There's the, the CGE also said the same thing, and that Eastern Cape is one of them. Is the CGE and the AG both lying? Thank you. Honorable, Honorable Member, Honorable Thank you. member I I am just reporting that we have received a, a response, a report from the Eastern Cape in February about the number of uh, termination of pregnancies that have been performed in that province, which means that there are services available. Thank you. Please continue. And regarding the, the mesh uh, that the Honorable Member is referring to, the Department of Health is in the process of reviewing guidelines and SOP to review the current practices, including the use of mesh. They will be finalized within this financial year. 
So we are looking at that. And once the guidelines that they will be monitored, and we will be monitoring if there is such practices. DG, I think those were the questions that I was supposed to respond to regarding HIV and TB and the maternal. Thank you. Thank, um, you. thank, you. The, thank you very much, Dr. Um, just to uh, to come in. Person, point of order through you, please. Can you so just hold it, please, Honorable Chirwa? What's your point of order? My question was about the fact that I asked the department to investigate the use of transvaginal and surgical mesh. And I wanted to do a follow up on how far the investigation has gone. Have they investigated the issue of surgical mesh crisis in South Africa now? Thank you. Honorable Chirwa, can I make a suggestion? Um, I think it might be difficult for the department to answer directly. Um, that's what I understand. Would you be willing to write to the department, and you can also forward those questions to me as the chair and the committee secretary? Um, I, I have, Chairperson, they have not responded. And if you're not happy with their responses or if they do not respond, um, that you will be f afforded another uh, opportunity to raise it again uh, with them on this platform. So let's try that, that, is, that is not fair. Chairperson, that is not fair. I, we're in a portfolio committee with the minister and his team. I'm asking them a follow-up on something I asked from them months ago together with Sapra. Sapra is not able to answer me. If Sapra can answer me, the NTOH must at least answer me. It means they have not investigated because they could easily say, yes, we've investigated this and this many cases. We're going, and then from that particular thing, we're going here. And they have not investigated. And I need them to say, we have not investigated. So I know that we can ask things in this portfolio committee and the department take them and throws them in the dustbin. It's clear. They did not investigate anything. They did not yes. investigate anything. Because they are telling me about general regulations. I'm, I'm asking... It's a peculiar question. There are women with leaking wombs in this country. Firstly, it's a sterilization. And that is a question. I think your approach is correct to say honorable Chirwa must write violence for this right in this country so that he can get a response. If he was not responded, he must write women, especially black women, consent to the minister. No, I just feel it's very much unfair for you to to take Honorable Chiro out of this meeting and you turn, you don't take Honorable Gela out of this meeting because it was the discussion and the, the thing that went on between the two of them. The fact yes. of the matter is Honorable Chiro is asking the department about the response of the question. 
that she previously asked. So this method that you use of, of saying take uh, 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 Honorable Chiro out of this meeting is, is unfair. And then I don't agree with it. Can she be brought back into this meeting so that her question can be answered effectively by the department? I'm here to protect her. And, the, and, yeah. and, 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 and secondly, Chairperson, this is not about the EFF and this is not about the ANC. So Honorable Gela must refrain from saying uh, we are tired. Who is she? You can say that she's tired. Who is she in the committee? She's a committee member like all of us here. So please, please, it, it's not fair. Oh, that, Jen. Bring, bring honorable. I, are you the, the principal committee. of this committee? Are you the Go principal? Go be tired of this with committee. your ANC government that's failing to do its work. You are tired of EFF, you are tired of ANC in this country. Oh, yes. Women yes. have leaking rooms. Yes. Yes. Women yes. have leaking rooms in this country. Yes. You want to give us great one answer? Yes. I want my answer. <laughs> Give yes, me answers. We you will get answers. your answers. We are not accountable. You will get the answers. I'm getting you accountable. Whether you like it or not, it's our job. And nobody must stop me from doing my job. They must give me my answers. You are muted, Chairperson. Honorable Chair, you are muted. You are muted. You are not audible, Honorable Chair. You are muted. Thank you. Maybe it is my problem. I can't hear the Chair, please. So the chair is muted. Now, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Honorable chair. Thank you very much. Honorable members, when the chairperson calls on you, then you need to at least keep quiet and listen to what the chairperson wants to say. It is not correct that we take the meeting in the way that, in the, in the direction that it goes. When one has a point to raise, raise it orderly. I, I, I think I'm a very fair chairperson that allows people to raise their points, but one can raise the same point in an ordered manner and then allow those you respond that you ask the question to allow them time to respond. And if they do not have the answer, we do have recourse in terms of them being able to either respond uh, um, in a written reply, or I go so far as to say, Write also to me, and I will assist you in the follow-up of that question. But to take this meeting, such a wonderful meeting, right at the end of the meeting to where we have taken it today, is not correct, and it's not correct in terms of the services that we deliver to our people. I really want to urge you not to do this. And when I said mute those members, I did not say remove that member, firstly. Secondly, I said members because both those members wouldn't listen to me when I was calling them. So I'm hoping that we've now ended that, we end that now, right there. I will allow the minister to respond to what was raised and we will take his response, whatever that response would be, and we move forward. Thank you very much, honorable members. Minister, can you please respond? Uh, can I proceed, minister, my part? Uh, yeah, uh, we don't have much time, uh, okay. Mr. Okay. Dagala. Okay. Oh, just, just very briefly on the infrastructure issues. Please, please just uh, talk quickly to that. Okay, okay, Minister. A quick one. Um, I, I'm going to start with an overview when it comes to the the facil healthcare facilities that were affected by the flooding in KZN. The there were six districts that were affected. And within those districts, uh, it was Itekwini, Ugu, Ilembe, Umbungundovu, King Tetrayo, and Umkanyagude. So the number of CHCs that were affected is 34. Uh, so number of cleans that were affect affected is 34. Number of CHCs that were affected is three. Number of hospitals that were affected is 23. And also the number of uh, other facilities, including offices and, and also the EMS uh, stations, were about five. 
the budgeting that is going to be required to fix the damage uh, uh, is about 200 million. Uh, it was quantified by the engineer, engineers that belongs to the Department of Health. So that's basically the overview picture uh, in terms of the facilities that were affected by the flooding. Um, I wanted also to touch on the item that was um, raised by Honorable uh, uh, Chirwa uh, regarding the status of Charlotte Matlek. Uh, when it comes to Charlotte Matlek, I must also indicate, just give a brief, brief background, quick, quick, a quick one. Uh, there was a fire last year, 16, uh, uh, 16 uh, April, uh, and, and the it, after that fire, there was a slow progress when it comes to the fixing of the areas that were affected by the fire. Um, I, I must also indicate that there were complaints that were forwarded to the office of the presidency, and then uh, the, the minister was um, uh, requested to intervene on the situation because there was a slow progress in terms of rectifying this uh, facility. And uh, on the 27th of uh, January, there was a meeting between the minister and the premier of the Gauteng province. Uh, it, in that meeting, it was agreed that the hospital, is, the, the project is going to be transferred to the National Department of Health. Um, we took over the project to date, uh, Honorable, we are intending to to open up the emergency unit. Uh, I've just received uh, just now, 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 uh, an occupation an occupancy certificate uh, by from the uh, uh, city of Johannesburg. We are uh, hoping to hand over uh, the unit uh, at the end of this month, and uh, and and then it will be operational from there onwards. There are other items that are supposed to be covered within the facility, and those items from block one until uh, up to block five, those items will be completed by the end of next year, and. Um, when we took over the project, it, the way the, the, the Department of Infrastructure was intending to finish the project in, uh, in January 2027, but uh, we have now reduced that timeline by 36 months. So we are, are on the right track. And also we have saved uh, about, uh, a money of uh, 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 some funding, which is about 305 million. Uh, the, the Department of Infrastructure, we're planning to do the work for about 1.4 billion. Uh, the National Department of Health is going to do this work uh, within one uh, around 1 billion uh, rand. So we are saving about 305 million rand uh, on, on the project. But the, 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 the whole project will be completed at the end of next year. So basically, that's the status around Charlotte Matlake. And then uh, let me cover the item that come from the Honorable Dr. Jacob uh, uh, in terms of um, the interventions uh, coming from the universities. Um, currently, we are um, in the process of reviving some of the PPP projects uh, that we put on, on hold a few years ago. Uh, these PPPs are, are inclusive of Chris Arney, uh, New King Edward, Dr. George Mukari, New Shoshanguve District Hospital and New Tigerberg Hospital. These PPP projects are related to uh, to the teaching uh, institutions, and 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 part uh, of the requirements of these uh, uh, teaching requirements is to partner with universities. We are in the process of negotiating a partnership with uh, universities for this. Uh, uh, of, of these uh, facilities. And they normally the universities, they normally fund their own sections where they will be using for teaching purposes. So that's basically my responses when it comes to infrastructure. infrastructure. Thanks, 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 Honorable Chair. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Magal. Okay, uh, uh, DG, I think we, uh, was there somebody still outstanding? We don't have much time. Maybe let's one more person, then we should round up. Yes, it's Pakiso on the nurses training and the colleges. That's all, Minister. Okay, Pakiso, you can come in, then we, we should conclude. And the issue of forced sterilization, it has not been answered.
Uh, DG, is Pakiso on the on the platform? Yes, she was uh, on the platform. Um, on the nurses issue, uh, Dr. Makanya is not here. No, no, she's not here. She had, she had asked Pakiso to stand in for her. I, I don't know what happened. I will, I will check her minister. Um, uh, whilst, um, uh, whilst we proceed, I'd like to request Dr. Chris just to come in on the sick, on the first uh, alleged for sterilization. Then we will, whilst I'm looking for Pakistan Minister, he will just be very brief. Uh, Dr. Chris. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, there's no time, so I'll be very brief. So there was an investigation done and a committee was uh, appointed. They did submit a, a report to the minister, but it was uh, beyond the scope of the actual answer of the questions. So they were asked to refine it to, con to uh, respond directly to the committee on uh, the Commission on Gender e Equality. And that was done, and that report has been submitted, as far as I'm aware, to the Commission of Gender Equality. But they, they're in the process of doing that. The committee that investigated raised a whole uh, raft of additional questions which are in the department for incorporation into um, more permanent structures of the department and other advisory committees to the minister. Because just a freestanding response to uh, allegations of this magnitude and potential problems that were raised would not have really served us in the long term. So the, that is what is happening is that the, um, and then regarding the, the people who were identified, um, there were 22 people on the original list of the 48 women who were identified in the report who were traced and their details were passed on to the heads of departments of the provinces where they reside, uh, requesting that they continue with the care, the clinical care of those patients within the services. So those were the actions that have taken been, been undertaken. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Chris. Uh, and, and Dr. Are, you, are you able to deal with the okay, Pakistan quickly on the nursing issues? Thank you, Minister Honorable Chair and other uh, uh, members. A uh, progress report on the training of nurses and opening of nursing colleges. Currently, 10 nursing colleges were designated through Government Gazette to offer the new nursing programs, including higher certificate diplomas and bachelor degrees. These are offered in all colleges with effect from January 2020. And currently, the, the department is finalizing accreditation, accreditation for po postgraduate diplomas in various specialties by the Council on Higher Education and uh, numbers per program per annual intake could be provided. And also to in indicate that uh, uh, the South Ar African Military Health Services is the 10th college. Thank you, DG. Thanks, Minister. We will hand back to the Minister. Thank you very much to the team. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Chair, let me just say that uh, um, we, are all, we are available to deal with any further matters which may not have been concluded uh, 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 to the satisfaction of members, um, we will be guided by yourself, uh, um, including on the issue of the first sterilization matter. Let me just make two points on that one that, as Dr. Crisp has indicated, one of the issues which we have found was that um, uh, in, in, the, in the report of the Co Commission for Gender Equality, there are a number of uh, uh, allegations which are made. As we went deeper into further investigation, uh, a number of those cases, um, there could not even be a substantiation of whether actually certain procedures were performed in terms of uh, 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 further accessing of uh, uh, the records which, which could indicate whether actually, uh, the, the, because the first thing, uh, before you conclude that um, whether it was voluntary or forced, first of all, was the procedure which is alleged actually performed. And uh, in many of those cases, I think there were only about two or three cases where actual cases of sterilization could be established. 
but that work we we will continue to to follow up uh, and let me just mention also that on a daily basis um, we receive uh, letters from particular lawyers uh, lawyers who have been appointed by a particular party also participating in this meeting uh, so uh, while we are dealing with the on the parliamentary side whenever we get these questions uh, we just need to uh, make the committee aware that um, we also almost on, on a daily basis receive letters of lawyers who are saying they've been instructed by a particular party uh, to make particular Point demands. Of order, so so Point of order. Uh, we're also dealing with that as they come. Um, um, Chair, just Point in of terms order. of, uh, I thought that was on the floor, Chairperson. Uh, can you the protect me? Can, can you protect me also? I, I've got the right to participate. In it's a meeting. point of order. Well, nobody's stopping you from participating. It's a point of uh, order. Honorable Chair, can you? I think I have the right to participate in this meeting. Can I? Can I get an opportunity to chair my meeting, both of you, please? Uh, Minister, I'm obliged to just take the point of order. And uh, Honorable Chirwa, let's let it be a point of order, and then yes. the minister will reply. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. The question was, we sent the department's names and contact details of women who have health issues. I personally took my, them to Steve Beagle. They were turned back because the issues with the Department of Health. So I'm asking them, did they deal with the issues, their health issues, those women who are forcefully sterilized, who are still leaking in their wombs as I speak now? Did they take their contact details and deal with their health issues or not? That was the question. Thank you very much, Honorable Chirwa. Um, Yes, um, <laughs> I'm very tempted to answer you on that question also as a medical specialist, um, because the, what you it's actually- It's a question ask, for the minister, Chairperson. Yes, it's a yes, question yes, for the what minister. What you're actually asking is also not medically correct, but I'm going to leave that question to the then minister. Then I took women to a hospital and we were turned back. That's medically incorrect. I'm asking as the department helps these women that we sent them names and contact yes. and their addresses, have what they helped them now? General what is medically is incorrect General about General that? This time around, I'm going to have you uh, don't, don't manipulate me because I'll manipulate you back. It's a simple question. Did they help them or not? As you wish to watch hey, Maria, did they help them or not? I'm calling you. And then the minister will answer the question. I'm calling you. Call the Honorable Jirwa for the last time. It's a question for the minister. Don't enter things that don't concern you. Did they help those women or not? That's it. Aunt and Clark. I'm going to allow the minister to answer. And minister, you have the right to say whatever is uh, the, the current situation. Did you uh, help them or not? That's the question. Yes or no? That's oh, it. Sure Wait no for the response. You have asked for the correct for the response. Why not sure stupid? Why not, not stupid? Not stupid. Not stupid. Not stupid. And I'm not going to be unfair, Dr. Temukwayo, no. if I remove Honorable Chair one again. I am still on the floor, and I'm the chairperson of this meeting. I need to be respected. Yes, you are not the minister, so don't answer questions for the minister. You are the chairperson, not the minister. Let the minister answer for himself. He's a minister for a reason. He will not answer for himself. You are not a minister, chairperson. You are a chairperson. The minister must answer. The minister must answer. Did you help the women or not? Ms. Majalamba. Thank you. Minister, please continue. Chair, I raise my hand. Honorable Munia, what, what are you raising? Is that so, a sorry, Chair, I know you are doing very well to share the meeting, but I, I wanted to say that, remember, we should not raise the point of orders to disrupt the minister from answering the question. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Munia. Honorable Minister, please continue. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Um, just going back on that matter, uh, just to say that uh, uh, um, while members are free to raise issues uh, if they are approached by um, members of the community in terms of uh, attention for care in our facilities, uh, but we must also... Sorry, uh, that uh, through you, uh, uh, Honorable Chairperson. 
The minister is responding to Honorable Naledi Jira's question. In her absence, can you allow her in so that she can listen to the response of the minister, please? Absent. I had seen her still on the system. Is she okay. absent now? But I thought maybe they removed her. Then I would say let her be let in because it's a response directly for her questions. She needs uh, to be... Honorable Dr. Temba Kwayo, let me address you also now. This has been ongoing for a while. It is a persisting problem. I am trying to address the problem. As the chairperson of this portfolio committee, I make rulings. The rulings need to be abided by, by the members of, the, uh, of parliament when I do make those rulings. I cannot consistently have somebody doing what she is doing. And now today you, you're insisting on protecting her. Let me do my work. I do appreciate you raising your concerns. But we do have other means through which we can do these things instead of becoming unruly and misbehaving. So let's put this on the back burner now. I think we will have the, that discussion as a portfolio committee. There are other avenues, like, for example, writing to the minister. And if you don't, uh, you don't have the satisfaction, write again. And if you don't have the sat satisfaction, bring it to the portfolio committee. But do not use this platform in order to create such havoc within, within my meeting. I will rule on that. That's the authority that was given to me. Thank you. Honorable Minister, Thank please answer the question. And if, if it is the question, if it's not the answer which uh, members would want to hear, they are free, right on the chat and say, you know, the minister has not answered my question in the way that I thought it ought to have been answered. Can the minister please write to us? We will always do that in the interest of the people of South Africa. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Just, just I don't want to take too much of your time. Just on that matter, to say that we also do have systems. Uh, we do have systems of how a particular medical conditions uh, get handled. Um, I know that one of the demands from some of the honorable members was that we should direct uh, all the, those kind of complaints to particular hospitals. We don't function, our system doesn't function that way. That's why Dr. Crisp indicated that where there were particular uh, uh, continuing uh, complaints of a medical nature, our approach was to link those particular uh, uh, patients with the uh, uh, provinces where the, uh, the alleged procedure would have happened so that their records can be found and so that if there's a, an allegation that there's a persistence of an aftermath of a particular procedure, then those records can be located in, the, in that particular facility and they can then be referred. If, if the matter, whatever complication can be handled at the lower level, then they can be referred if, for instance, the alleged procedure happened in a particular part of case and as an example there were a number of cases of that nature they will be evaluated at that level if they need a specialist there is a particular referral system in the case that and province and so is all the other provinces so the insistence okay have that, you done that have you done what you're talking about now have you done it now, chair i'm being interrupted again can, can have you, you allow the minister to respond to you Ra? Hey, charity begins at home. Um, hey, hey, he must, must respond like a, a, like a knowledgeable ah, man. Well, one of the person at Gala is now interrupting. No, you ah, so. man, me, 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 you me, must uh, also, have the manners. I man. also deserve to be protected. Oh, don't say that. Don't say I don't have manners when I get. Never say that. Chair, you are muted. Order, Chair. Order, Chair. Must be a heaving so. Order, Chair. No, I'm not going to take any other orders now. Minister, you're going to uh, say your the last. The parliament should I'm apply where the disruption of the meeting. Any others, no one else. I'm going to make a ruling. Minister, you have one minute. Then I'm going to close Thank my meeting. Thank you. Thank, th thank you very much, uh, Chair. Just one, a few other points. Uh, just to say to members who have raised issues about the staffing shortages of staff, and for instance, whether we are able to absorb the staff who had been employed as a result of uh, COVID. Uh, the answer is uh, it, it all depends on the resources allocated. As the acting CFO has indicated, while there is a better 
resource allocation uh, better than some other departments, but we are still far short in terms of uh, uh, being able to keep all the staff who are actually uh, needed. The last matter, which I just want to uh, mention, Chair, is that uh, there is a matter of, of uh, which had been raised by Honourable uh, Harvard on the effect of undocumented migrants. I think it's a matter which at some stage will report to the committee. I, I've just asked the team to do a proper assessment um, and so that we could have a, 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 an advice and proposal from the committee as well as to how we deal with this matter. Some of our facilities in Gauteng, for instance, uh, if you look at the area of maternity, some of them uh, uh, deal with 60% of, of their maternity uh, uh, clients being undocumented uh, uh, migrants. Um, some of them, yeah, it ranges between 40 to 60%. Uh, many of those are not booked, so have not attended antenatal services, and they, they contribute a lot to some of the severe outcomes both in terms of um, maternal and also in terms of uh, infant um, uh, the neonatal outcomes. Um, but it's also quite a huge drain on the fiscals and, and on the capacity of our health facilities. So I just want to, to flag that and say, we'll come back and give a full report to the committee in terms of uh, uh, this challenge. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. I, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister and the Department. Uh, just for noting uh, to the members, you have other avenues like writing uh, to, the, to the Ministry for oral replies and for written replies. If you have any other questions, I've seen some questions sent to me by, by Honorable Members. But I think in, uh, in light of the difficulties we've been having towards the end of our meeting, I'm not going to allow any other questions to be raised. So please use all of the other avenues which you have uh, at your availability. Again, thank you very much uh, for the presentations and for the answers. Any questions which are not answered, please say, uh, answer them in writing. And uh, ourselves as the members will be looking forward to, to those. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Person. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank Recording you. stopped. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.